بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد Brothers and sisters I sincerely begin with the greeting of Assalamu alaikum and peace to one and all and a very good evening to all of you dynamic youth This program is organized by Youth Alive and Adil in partnership with Bayina our esteemed speaker for this evening is Al Ustad Norman Ali Khan. He is the founder and CEO of Bayina, as well as the lead instructor for a number of Bayina courses, including the fundamentals of classical Arabic and device speech. Currently, he has dedicated himself to a seven long year project of conducting a linguistic and literary focus on Quranic tafsir series in English. He is also a well-known figure amongst youth online. His latest project is Bayina TV, and he is spending countless hours to record Arabic and Quranic curriculum for all, available at Bayina TV. Ustaz Norman, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya'i wal Mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi ila yawmid din Allahumma ja'alna minhum wa min al-lazina amanu wa amilu salihat Wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen I'd like to first of all thank uh, the organizers here Muiz especially and the volunteers and the sponsors for this program to make this visit for myself and my team possible. It's been a dream of mine to be able to visit Muslims from all over the world and especially in this part of the world. And Alhamdulillah, Allah opens these doors. And I want to start by requesting all of you to make dua for the team of mine that's traveling and our families that we've left behind that Allah makes the separation easy for them. And that Allah Azza wa put barakah in this trip for all of us and in this gathering for all of us, uh, including yourselves of course, inshaAllah ta'ala. So tonight, I'm supposed to be talking to you about the Fatiha, and this is something I, these topics that I chose during this trip, uh, and I'm also very grateful about that, because I was actually given the liberty to pick whatever topic I'd like to talk to you about, and I chose to speak about the Fatiha this evening with all of you. Um, and some of you might be wondering, why does he need three hours to talk about the Fatiha? So <laughs> that curiosity should get answered pretty soon, or maybe not that soon, but... <laughs> Um, what I'm going to try to do is share some things with you about the Fatiha and hopefully that will give you an appreciation of how to approach the rest of the Qur'an in a slightly different way. And maybe with perhaps paying a little more attention than you and I are used to paying attention to it. So with that inshallah ta'ala I'm going to begin and I'm going to give you guys a request, everybody here. When I ask you a question, you have to answer me as loud as you can. Otherwise, this is the only way I know you're still alive. I have no other way of knowing. So if I ask you a question, just try to call out the answer as loud as you can. Now if you're still shy, or you belong to a social class in which speaking out loud is beneath you, then you can just pretend like, like that. That's fine too. Okay? But if I see some of you sitting and staring at me with your mouth closed, like... No then I'm going to call you out. Okay, so <laughs> try to at least, try to participate as much as you possibly can, inshallah ta'ala. And, and this is really a, a one, it's a long journey for all of us tonight. And I don't want anybody to go to sleep, at least not yet. So let's try to be as engaged as we possibly can be. Alhamdulillah, the most beautiful surah of the Qur'an is the first surah of the Qur'an. It's the first complete surah revealed. Many of you are familiar that there are a lot of narrations that Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq was the first revelation. But that was, the, it was a passage of a surah, but not the entire surah. Right? So the Fatiha, by many accounts, is the first complete surah given to the Prophet ﷺ. Historically, there's been a difference. What is the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha? Some people believe that the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Other scholars believe that the first ayah of Surah Al-Fatiha is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So there's a difference. Now, tonight, because we have limited time, I'm not going to discuss the details of that difference. Also, only because of time, 
If I started with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we would be here the entire evening just on Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'm going to share with you the position that I personally find more convincing. And that position is that the Fatiha actually begins with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Though I do respect the position on the other side, I feel there are plenty of strong indications in the Qur'an itself and also in the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Fatiha begins with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, that it begins from there. For instance, in a very famous hadith Qudsi, if you ever get a chance to read an explanation of the Qur'an from a classical scholar, they'll mention this hadith when they're explaining the Fatiha. And the hadith is very famous, it says, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِ نِصْفَيْنِ I divided the prayer between myself and my slave into two halves. And then the, the hadith walks us through the entire Fatiha. But it doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That hadith actually walks us through, إِذْ قَالَ الْعَبْدِ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ It begins with when my slave says, أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ and then goes on and on and on. Which means it's a pretty cool indication that Fatiha begins with what? Let's see if you're awake now. What does it begin with? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Okay, so that's what we're going to begin with. Now, the first phrase of the Fatiha is something Muslims use all the time. All the time. What is that phrase? Alhamdulillah. We use it like in our daily conversation, when we meet each other, you ask somebody how they're doing and immediately the first thing that comes out is Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, right? You even use it when you want somebody to stop talking. Okay, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, okay, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, so we use it in funny ways. But you know, this, this first phrase, we're going to try to pay a little extra attention to it. One of the things that I'm a student of is language. And how, not just what Allah says, but how He says it. And are there other ways of saying it? So let me begin with a very simple exercise. And I need you to be a little loud there. What translation of Alhamdulillah have you read before? Try to call it out. Call it out, call it out. Praise belongs to Allah. Anything else? Thank you Allah. That's a pretty interesting translation. Thank you Allah, okay. Thank you Allah. That reminds me of my mother-in-law actually. Because one time she was so happy she said, Jazakallah Allah. <laughs> but anyway, so a lot of translations say praise belongs to Allah, thanks to Allah. Yes? But today I want to start with something. The word hamd in the Arabic language means two things. And I want everybody here to remember that hamd means two things. The first thing it means is athana, which means praise. That's correct. And the second thing it means is thanks. Praise and thanks. And these are two different things. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. So the first conversation I want to have with you is, what is the difference between praise and thanks? That's the first thing I want you and myself to be reminded of. You pass, you're walking on the street, you see a really nice car. What do you do? Praise it or thank it? <laughs> Hopefully you don't thank it. Like you don't like go over to the car and pat it on the hood and say thank you so much BMW. You don't, you don't do that. You say nice car. You praise it. Praise is a separate issue. Now for instance you, have, you go to somebody's house who just had a baby. And even though my personal opinion is new babies are really, they look like very old men. But you know, you're supposed to go and be nice and say so cute. Oh so beautiful. Even though it looks like all weird and like a dinosaur and you know. I can say that, I have six kids, I can say that. I have no shame in saying it. But anyway, so you go over to a child, you know, a family, and you say, what a cute baby. And what have you just done? Have you praised or thanked? You've praised. You don't thank a baby. You praise it. You understand? You don't thank, when you're watching, a, a, you know, sports, and you see an incredible athlete, you praise the athlete. Wow, that was awesome. You don't thank the athlete, you praise the athlete. You understand? But thanks is something entirely different. Thanks is only done when someone does something for you. When something, someone does something for you. So when you see something impressive, when you see something beautiful, when you see something that in, intrigues you and interests you, then you will praise it. But when, you, when someone does you a favor, when someone does something nice for you, then you will thank and you won't necessarily praise. 
Someone you praise is not necessarily someone you thank. Is that clear? When you praise something, you don't necessarily thank it. But the opposite is also true. The converse is also true. When you thank something, or you thank someone, you don't necessarily praise them. Let's, let's think about that for a second. How do you thank someone without praising them? I'll give you an example or two from the Qur'an. You know, Musa alayhi salam was raised in a pretty interesting household. Where was he raised? What's his address? <laughs> pretty famous address, yes? And so he is being, he's been adopted by Fir'aun. Now Fir'aun has raised him and when years later when Musa alayhi salam came back, Fir'aun basically said, how dare you? How dare you talk to me this way? And he, he said to him, Alam nurabbika fina walida, walabithna fina min umurika sinin. Didn't we raise you as a newborn in this house? Didn't we raise you here? In our midst? Didn't you spend many years of your life here? You could talk to me like that? What is he saying? Aren't you what? Aren't you what? Fill in the blank for me. No, the answer is not, aren't you sleepy? That's not the answer. Aren't you what? Aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful? And Musa alayhi salam actually when he responds, he says, وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ That is in fact a favor you did for me. Thanks. That's his way of saying, thanks. In other words, even Fir'aun who will never be praised, the guy will never be praised, not by a prophet, not by a Muslim. But when he does a favor, he will still be what? Thanked. Thanks can exist without praise. Quran talks about the rights of parents. The parents here know that because they use it all the time. But anyway, the Quran talks about the rights of parents. And Allah says about parents, Anishkur li waliwalidayk. Be grateful to me and to both of your parents. Wa in jahadaka ala an tushrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilm. If your parents are struggling against you, they're telling you to do shirk. And shirk is pretty bad. I don't think anything gets worse than shirk. And parents are telling you to do shirk, don't obey them. But the ayah began, you still have to be grateful to them. In other words, if they are doing shirk, would you praise what they're doing? You wouldn't praise. But even though they're still your parents, so you would still what? You'd still thank. You would still thank. Think about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He does not praise what his father does. But he's still thankful, isn't he? So what I'm trying to get at, my first conversation with you, is alhamd, hamd in the Fatiha, is two things. Now you tell me what they were? Praise and thanks. And are those two things different or the same? They're different. And sometimes you can have praise without thanks, and sometimes you can have thanks without praise. Now we turn to what Allah is saying in alhamdulillah. He's saying praise is for Allah. And He's also saying, Thanks is for Allah, and He's not just saying one of them or the other one. Now, what it, you know, if, if the Arabic language said al madhu lillah in Arabic, al madhu lillah means praise is for Allah. I'd be okay with the translation because madh actually just means praise. If it said a shukru lillah, if it said that, then I would have been okay with thanks is for Allah, gratitude is for Allah. But Allah said, Alhamdulillah, which means He combined both of them. So how is this better? Well, it's better for a number of reasons. The first reason is, when you praise something, sometimes it's not genuine. For example, you're driving a little too fast, and the police officer pulls you over, and the first thing you look at him is a nice hat, officer. Looking very dashing today. <laughs> Well, you're praising the guy, but you're actually not really praising the guy. You're hoping you don't get a ticket. That's what that is, right? Or some of you younger, student, younger, younger people in the audience, you get a really bad report card. And you walk home. And you say, Mom, your cooking today is so delicious. <laughs> she hasn't even cooked yet. <laughs> You're praising, but it's not genuine. Praise could be fake. There's fake praise that's done for kings. There's fake praise that's done for bosses, for judges. It's done all the time. Overly formal praise, just to impress somebody, but you don't really mean it. 
Right? For example, when you go to a job interview and it was a terrible interview, it was the worst job interview you ever took. Even then, when you're leaving, you say, nice to meet you. <laughs> it wasn't nice, but you still have to say that. It's fake praise. You understand? So when the word madh is used, it could be fake. It could be fake. It's actually not entirely appropriate for Allah. Now let's think about shukr. If Allah said, ashukru lillah, which means thanks is for Allah. Thanks is for Allah. You know what? Thanks is only done when you acknowledge a favor. Something was done for you, and you realize it was done for you, and then you finally thank. You had a flat tire, somebody came and helped you out, you say, thank you. If you had a flat tire, and you had no idea that somebody else is, you know, even going, trying to help you, you're sleeping in the car, or whatever, you know, you have no one to thank. Thanks can only happen when you have somebody to thank and you realize the favor that's been done. In other words, thank you is a reaction. Is that clear to everybody? Thank you is always a what? Reaction. Thank you is not something you start with, ever. You don't meet somebody just walking out, hey, thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> you don't do that. That's strange. Allah Azza wa Jal used the word hamd, which combines praise and thanks. And by the way, hamd in the Arabic language, in the Arabic sense of the word, can only be genuine. It cannot be manufactured. It cannot be fake. And it's not necessarily reactionary. It's not reactionary. It's more powerful than saying alhamdulillah. It's more powerful than saying ashukrulillah. It is more comprehensive than both of them. Allah chose something to say that is more, better than both of them combined. Subhanallah. Then here's the final thing. What if, you know how in English, how many words do I have to use for hamd? So far, how many words do I have to use? Two. But Allah used how many words? One. So you're learning about a complication in the Qur'an and when we translate the Qur'an. Sometimes Allah uses one word, but to get the idea across, you need a couple of words. Isn't that true? But what if Allah Himself used both words? What if Allah said, Al-Madhu wa shukru lillah? If Allah Himself used two words, praise and thanks is for Allah. If He used both of them, would it be the same? Actually, no. It won't be the same because of a very beautiful principle of the Arabic language. And it's actually a principle of all languages, as a matter of fact. They say in Arabic, Khayrul kalami ma qalla wa dalla, which means in simple English, the best kind of speech is that's very few words and gets the point across. You use lesser words and get your point across. That is the best kind of speech. Now some of you, mashallah, have friends that you talk to for 30 minutes, but they still haven't made a point yet. They're, they say a lot, but, but they actually don't say anything. And you're still hoping they get to the point. <laughs> you know? And some people use too many words to even describe the simplest things. Like today, I was going over this architectural device that is used one step after the other to go from one floor to another. You just took the stairs. <laughs> just, just see, I took the stairs. <laughs> you don't have to go into unnecessary details. The best kind of speech is the one that's brief, that's less, that's easier on the tongue. So alhamd is even better than saying al-madhu wa shukru lillah. But there's another difference. There's another difference. And that is that in the Arabic, in Old Arabic, when you put and in between two things, the word and is very simple, we use it all the time. But when you put and, hey guys, 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 stop with the pictures, it's distracting. And I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> like, oh, okay, <kidding>, okay. <laughs> Everybody's looking at you guys. And you're taking their photo and they're taking your photo and it's like a confusing scene. But anyway, so they won't stop. Relentless, okay. What was I talking about? Surah Al-Baqarah or something? What was I saying? <laughs> I forgot. What was I talking about? And. Okay. When you use and in Arabic, what's the Arabic word for and? Anybody know? Wa. It separates two things even in meaning. You know what that means? If you say Al-Madhu wa ashukru lillah, you're saying praise belongs to Allah for some things and thanks belongs to Allah for some other things. They're not always combined, because the word isn't combined. Since you separated them, sometimes you're in the mood to praise Allah but not thank Him. And sometimes you're in the mood to thank Allah but not praise Him. But when you say Alhamdulillah, for whatever you're saying Alhamdulillah, what's the reality? You're praising Him and you are 
thanking him. At the same time, you don't get to pick which one. You don't get to pick which one. So now, for example, you're walking by a nice car, and you look at a nice car, and you say, Alhamdulillah, what have you just done? You praised Allah for giving human beings the ability to do that, to design that, to manufacture that. And you thanked Allah, you thanked Allah to be able to give you the chance to sit in one without the owner realizing or something. I mean, <laughs> but you're praising and thanking at the same time. That's what you're doing. Now this informs the attitude of the Muslim. So often when somebody comes and talks to you, you're having a bad day. How's it going? Oh, Alhamdulillah. You're not really praising Allah when you say that. You're not really thanking Him when you say that. Alhamdulillah is not just something we say, it's an attitude. It's an attitude. Allah is not interested in what comes out of our tongues. He's more interested in what comes out of our tongues that is connected to our hearts. So we have to mean what we say when we say Alhamdulillah. For instance, you got stuck in traffic and you say Alhamdulillah. That's kind of hard to think about, isn't it? Because you guys, I'm sure you get stuck in traffic a lot. So when you get stuck in traffic and you say Alhamdulillah, what are you saying? Ya Allah, as bad as this might seem, I'm sure there wisdom, there's wisdom in it and there's something good in this for me and I thank you for it. And I praise you and I, and I praise the fact that I am safe. I'm happy for the fact that I'm, you know, I have a car <laughs> that I can get stuck in traffic with, but at least I have a car, that I have a job. You know, you, have, you start thinking positively. What, it, what Alhamdulillah does, it forces the Muslim to start thinking positively. That's what it does. So that's the first thing I wanted to talk to you about, Alhamdulillah. Let me keep track of time. I have about five minutes left before Maghrib. So let's get a few things out of the way. The second thing I want to talk to you about, in Alhamdulillah, just still on Alhamdulillah so far, is that in the Arabic language, you can use nouns and you can use verbs. And now this is going to sound like a grammar lesson. But hopefully, I mean, you guys are probably much better at English grammar than us back home in America. When I, when I use the word English grammar, people start falling into depression in America. And it's like, Astaghfirullah, what's he talking about? Like, don't look at me. You know, but I think the level of English education here is actually better. So, nouns and verbs. Now, which one of these has tense? Like past tense and present tense and future tense. Which one of these has tense? Verbs have tense. Nouns don't have a tense. There's no past tense noun or present tense noun or future tense noun. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. So now, when I say I praise Allah, and I'm, I mean praise and thank, because I've already covered that, but I'm being brief in English now. When I say I praise Allah, did I use a noun or a verb? Here's the question. Oh my God, it's a PhD question. Huh? That's a verb, isn't it? If I say, we praise Allah, is that a noun or a verb? That's a verb. What tense is it? Past tense, present tense? That's present tense, yes? Okay. When I say, praise belongs to Allah, is the word praise a noun or a verb? Is that clear to everybody that praise is a noun? Allah could have used a verb. I mean, in Arabic, you could say, Ahmadullah, I praise Allah. Nahmadullah. Like you hear the khutbah, Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. You've heard this before? Right before you go to sleep? Right? So you've heard, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. So, it's a verb. Oh, 10 minutes left. Fantastic. So, Nahmaduhu, we praise Him. Ahmaduhu, I praise Him. But Allah didn't say I or we. He didn't use the present tense, he actually used a noun. Now the thing I told you very basically was, nouns don't have a tense. There's no past, no present, or no future. But verbs have what? They have tense, they have present. They have present tense, past tense, future tense. Now the thing of it is, here's what makes this beautiful. If I say, I praise Allah, then I'm only talking about the present. I said nothing about the past, and I said nothing about the future. If I use the past tense, then I'm not guaranteeing anything about the present or the future. Because a tense has to be one or the other. Has to be one or the other. And by the way, just because I'm praising Allah right now, does it guarantee the next hour or no? No, it's limited, isn't it? It's not permanent. A verb is not permanent. Allah used a noun, and nouns are what? Permanent. Allah's praise is described with permanence. You know what that does? That means I am only praising Allah now. 
but the praise of Allah has always been there. And I may not be there forever, but the praise of Allah will always be there. The thanks to Allah will always be there. It is not dependent on me. Huge reality in Alhamdulillah is that Alhamdulillah does not depend on me. And that's the second point I want to make about nouns and verbs. Pay attention to this part. Right? I, I think we can get this across. When you use a verb, somebody needs to do the verb. It's called the subject or the fa'il in Arabic. Somebody needs to do a verb. You can't just go into a conversation and say, fail the test. Who failed the test? You know, you can't just say, disappeared. Who disappeared? Oh, my pen, my pen disappeared. <laughs> you, you see, when you use a verb, you need to have someone who does it. You need a subject. You can't just have a verb by itself. It doesn't make sense. It, cre it's, it creates confusion. But a noun doesn't need someone to do it. A noun doesn't need a subject. A noun is in independent by itself. An apple is an apple. You don't have to say, who ate it? You don't have to do that. It's by itself. You know, when Allah uses the word alhamd, He made it independent. It doesn't need anyone. If He used a verb, then it needs someone, doesn't it? It needs someone to do the praise. Either I praise, or you praise, or we praise. But Allah made it independent of a person or a being. It's even more powerful than everything praises Allah and everyone praises Allah because even if everything and everyone was mentioned then it would still be only the, the ones everything and everyone right now but Allah did not want to limit it by time or by the people who do it Subhanallah Allah is not in need of you and me saying Alhamdulillah we acknowledge, when we say Alhamdulillah we acknowledge to Allah that Allah is, does not need us, we need Him that's what we're acknowledging in just the phrase Alhamdulillah. So what have I given you so far? When we say Alhamdulillah, it makes us optimistic. That's the first thing I gave you. When we say Alhamdulillah, now it makes us humble. It makes us realize things don't depend on us. We depend on Allah. You know, Allah doesn't depend on us and He doesn't need us. We're not doing Him a favor by saying Alhamdulillah. We're only doing ourselves a favor by saying Alhamdulillah. And here's the last bit. I think I can make this one happen. Commands. A kind of verb. A special kind of verb is commands. Like for example, in Arabic you could say, Ihmadullah. Praise Allah. Praise Allah. Like if, you know, and it could be made as a request to, let's pray Maghrib. Or you can tell your child, bring me water. Right? So for example, when I'm home and I tell my daughter, hey, Husna, bring me water. She has two choices. When you give someone a command, there are two choices, right? What are the two choices? Either they do it or they don't do it. So if I, give, if I tell Husna, bring me water, she has two choices. Either she will bring me water or she will bring me water. <laughs> There's two clear choices for her, right? If Allah says to anybody, even if Allah says, praise Allah, what are the two things that will happen? Some people will do it and some people will not do it. And therefore, when you tell someone to do something, the ball is in their court. It depends on them. Maybe they'll do it, and maybe they won't. Allah did not talk about praise in a way that depends on us. He didn't put the ball in our court. He said, whether you do it or not, who cares? It's still there. Alhamdulillah, it's still there. It's been there forever, it will be there forever. Human beings will come and go, generations will come and go, this world will come and go, the hamd of Allah will still be there. It's a matter of fact. I think in these last two minutes, I can get this across. I'm going to squeeze as much as possible in here. And hopefully we can finish the conversation, at least most of it, of Alhamdulillah before we go. I'm at least, just Alhamd, we haven't even got to Lillah yet. Just Alhamd. Maybe Lillah after the Salat, okay? But just about one, one last thing about Alhamd. There are two kinds of communication the Arab linguist argues. In linguistics and Balagha studies, they argue that there are two kinds of communication. It's informative or emotional. Jumla insha'iya, jumla khabariya, they say. Kalam insha'i, kalam khabari. That's technical terms. You don't have to know that. It won't increase your iman or anything. But I'm just, I'll give you the, the, the simple version of that. Either you have speech that is expressing your feelings, 
or you have speech that is communicating information. Two kinds of speech. Now that sounds really technical and very hard to understand, so let me make it simple for everybody. When I say to so I sit somebody down and I explain something to them, is that an act of delivering information or is that emotion? When I explain something to someone, information. Informa like for example, as I'm discussing the Fatiha with you or saying things about Alhamdulillah, this is informative speech. Yes? It's informative speech. We take a break for Maghrib. You are leaving your chair and you're making lots of dua. Ya Allah, I have the front row seat. Let no one take this place. <laughs> and so, you know, as you, are, as you are sitting there before the salams are said, you're like, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And then just, it's kind of. And then you dash back here and you, you know, elbow as many people as you can to get back in your chair and you see that it's empty and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is what? Alham now at that point, maybe nobody's in the hall yet. You're like, am I on the wrong floor? <laughs> you know? But when you say Alhamdulillah and nobody's even there, are you informing someone about Alhamdulillah? No. At that time, you use the same phrase Alhamdulillah for what? Expressing your... Emotions. If I'm teaching someone Alhamdulillah, if I'm teaching someone, then I am actually being informative. But if I'm saying it to myself, the same phrase, it can be emotional. You understand the difference? Now, let's talk about this. In the khutbah, when you go to the khutbah at the masjid, the khatib begins, Inna alhamdulillah. You ever heard this? Inna alhamdulillah. What's the first word you heard? Inna. Thank you for being awake. What's the first word you heard? Inna. What does anybody know what inna means? Certainly. For sure. Absolutely. Hamd is for Allah. Absolutely. Hamd is for Allah. Now what's more powerful? Is saying hamd is for Allah more powerful? Or saying absolutely hamd is for Allah? What sounds more powerful? Absolutely hamd is for Allah. Inna sounds more powerful. And the khatib uses it every Jumu'ah. The question is, how come Allah didn't use it? How come Allah didn't say, Inna alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim maliki yawmidin ya? Because it's a very powerful statement. Why not make it more powerful by adding Inna? After all, you've been listening your whole life. Quran is perfect. You can't even add one word. You can't even add one word. It's perfect the way it is. So what difference would it make? I could just throw in a little Inna. Khatib does it all the time. I could do it too. The only difference is when you use inna in Arabic linguistics, when you use inna, the statement can only be informative. The statement can only be informative. It cannot be what kind of statement? Emotional. Emotional. Now if you don't use inna, your statement could be informative and could be emotional. By not using inna, Allah actually made alhamdulillah a statement we use to tell others. And we, He also made alhamdulillah a statement that we tell ourselves. Subhanallah. The beauty of it is now it's used in, the, in communicating the feelings of our hearts and also a message we want to give to somebody else. Both of them, if inna alhamdulillah is used, then actually technically it's not an expression of one's emotion. It's only meant to talk to somebody else, not to yourself. Subhanallah. And the khatib, obviously, the khatib is not talking to himself first. Who's he talking to? Everybody else. So he says, Inna alhamdulillah. I want you guys to remember alhamdulillah. He's telling you. So he uses inna. The point I've been trying to make thus far before our break is that every phrase in the Quran, starting with alhamdulillah, is so perfect the way Allah says it. That no matter what variation you try to come up with, use a verb instead, use inna, use shukr, use madh, you don't get what Allah communicated. You don't get what Allah Azza wa Himself said. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Alhamdulillah after our break. After we come back from Salat, it's 7.20 already, so I'm going to, I'm going to be back. I'll give you a full half hour because there's a lot of people here. So 7.50, inshaAllah ta'ala, we're going to reconvene. I don't care if no one is here. I can talk while no one is here. I can talk while you're talking to each other. 
you're catching up on old times, you've met an old enemy and you want to rekindle the fight, whatever you want to do, that is up to you. But I will start talking at 7.50, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallahu li wa lakum. So, what were we talking about? Surat Ali Imran. Ayah number... What were we talking about? How far did we get? <laughs> so, you guys are, alhamdulillah, familiar with the English language. So, I, I'll say two sentences. You tell me which one sounds normal. I ate lunch. That's the first sentence. Second sentence. Lunch, I ate. Which one sounds normal to you? I ate lunch. Okay. They went to school. To school they went. Which one sounds more normal? Which one sounds more normal? Say that again. I went to school. Or they went to school. Yeah? But if I say to school they went, do you still understand me? Okay. So one is normal and one is strange, but they're still both understandable. Yes? Okay. This is actually, I'm not just trying to tell you how Yoda speaks in like, Star Wars, you know, strong the forces or whatever. But I'm actually telling you that in the Arabic language, sometimes the sequence of a sentence is changed and it's made strange. When you walk to the Eid prayer, when you're driving to the Eid prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What do we say? Lillahi alhamd Lillahi alhamd What does Fatiha say? Alhamdu Lillah It's the same words But they have been put in Reverse sequence And this is not just when you're walking to the Eid prayer It's actually in the Quran also Walillahi alhamd Rabbil samawati Warabbil ard Rabbil alameen It's there in the Quran Sometimes Allah says Alhamdulillah Actually seven times Allah says Alhamdulillah And a couple of times in the Quran you also find Lillahi alhamd The unfortunate thing is that they're translated exactly the same way But they're actually not the same thing, they're two different things And I want to explain to you what the difference is between Alhamdulillah and what? Lillahi alhamd How come Allah said Alhamdulillah in the Fatiha? And what difference does it make if He didn't just say Lillahi alhamd? This is one of the last things I'll tell you about, at least alhamd. In Arabic, when you use the unusual sequence, let's go back to my example. I ate lunch. What was the strange way of saying it? Lunch, I ate. Remember that? When you use the unusual sequence, what you are actually saying is, I did not eat anything else. I only ate lunch. But they don't have to use the word only. They can just mess up the sequence. And it communicates the word only. If I say they went to school, it's normal. But if I say to school they went, what am I actually trying to say in, in the Arabic sense? In Arabic logic, what am I saying? They only went to school. They didn't go to the movie theater. They didn't go to play sports. They didn't go to work. They only went to school, nowhere else. You understand? So it adds one word to the meaning when you reverse the sequence. What word is added? Only. And I want you to think about this word only in a, another context so you, you help uh, understand it better. As a teacher, I used to teach elementary school. I used to teach, you know, at one point I taught kindergarten. At one point I taught second and third grade. One of the best experiences of my life and also one of the worst experiences of my life. But anyway, so I'm teaching third grade and you know, uh, you know two girls in the back are talking of the class. Zainab and Fatima. And I can tell you one thing about girls, because I got four of those. They can talk. <laughs> so two girls in the back, they're just going at it, talking, 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 talking. And I say, Zainab. And she goes, I wasn't the only one. <laughs> now when she says, I wasn't the only one, what is she actually saying? If I am going to the principal's office, Fatima better come with me. But she didn't have to say another sentence. She only used what one word strategically? 
only. So if you use the word only strategically, then you actually can be saying two things by saying one thing. That's the cool thing about saying the word only. So for instance, if I say, I didn't only come to Singapore, then I didn't say more, but you understand what I mean, right? I also went to Malaysia, etc. Right? You can fill in the blanks. Now Allah says sometimes, Lillahi alhamd. Hamd only belongs to Allah. Hamd only belongs to Allah. Fill in the rest. There is more. It's implied. What is it? Hamd only belongs to Allah. I'll wait for you. Let this get awkward. I don't care. I'll wait. Hamd only belongs to Allah. Very good. No one else. It doesn't belong to anyone else. Full stop. When you say only, then you are actually saying Hamd only belongs to Allah and not anybody else. Allah says, Lillahi alhamd in the 45th surah, Surah al Jathiyah, at the very end of the 45th surah. It's incredible that the entire 45th surah is a debate with people who do shirk. The entire surah is a debate. And at the end of that debate, Allah says to the mushrik, Hey, Hamd only belongs to Allah. And what is He saying to the mushrik? It only belongs to Allah, it does not belong to anyone else. In other words, Lillahi alhamd is a way of talking to someone who doesn't agree with you. When Muslims talk to each other, we don't say Lillahi alhamd, we say what? Alhamdulillah, because we don't have that confusion, guys. We don't have that confusion. You don't talk to a Muslim and say, hey, hamd only belongs to Allah. You got that? No, we just say alhamdulillah because we're like, la ilaha illallah is kind of done. We're okay with that part. You understand? So there's no need for debating. No need to use that tone. There's no need for that. I'll give you, wow, why is the echo getting weirder and weirder? Are you, are you remixing me right there? Okay. So, so here's the thing. I'll tell you a little story. And as I travel across the, the country, one time earlier on, and this was actually very recently after, or very soon after 9-11, when the country was very tense also, I traveled to Louisiana. I don't recommend that, but I traveled to Louisiana. And I'm traveling and, you know, I, um, I stop at a gas station, I'm getting gas, and the guy looks at me, the guy with the pickup truck, and I don't know, usually the pickup truck has a shotgun in the back, I don't know. And he goes, you from Islam, boy? And I'm like, what should I say? <laughs> you know, I mean, if I say no from New York, it's even worse for them. But I said, uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Now, when I say praise the Lord, he goes, amen to that, and he left. <laughs> <laughs> When I say praise the Lord, can it be somebody understands me differently? Is that possible? Now if I said to him, praise Allah, click, click, you know. <laughs> but praise the Lord can be understood by different people in different ways, yes? It can be. The next point, I'm getting at the next point now. And that next point is, Allah introduced us to Himself in Surah Al-Fatiha. He didn't want to make it a debate. He didn't want to yell at us when he started the Qur'an. He wanted to speak to us as though the conclusion, Alhamdulillah, is not a debate. It is something you already know. It is something already in your heart. So there's no reason to say, Lillahi alhamd. Allah will say what instead? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know what that's teaching us? That Alhamdulillah is already in my heart. It was already there. I didn't have to be convinced of it. It didn't have to be stuck, stuck into me. The mushrik lost it. So he had to be given it again. So he had to be told, Lillahi alham. Now, th this is the next part. This is really cool. Allah has how many names at least? 99 names. Allah did not say, Alhamdulil Rahman, Alhamdulil Rahim, Alhamdulil Malik, Alhamdulil Khaliq, Alhamdulil Wahab, Alhamdulil Qahar. All of those are correct. All of those are correct. None of them are wrong. How come Allah used Alhamdulillah and what? Allah. Fatiha is Allah introducing Himself. When you introduce yourself to someone, 
You use your description or your name? You use your name. If you don't know who I am, I don't walk up to you and say, Assalamu alaikum, I'm a teacher. What? Assalamu alaikum, I'm Norman. And if I say, Assalamu alaikum, I'm a teacher, they all say, Wa alaikum salam, you're also strange. And walk away. <laughs> you know? You don't start introducing yourself with a description, you introduce yourself with a name. The other thing is, let's just say, let's just play along and say maybe the word Allah is not there. Take it off. What do you have left? You have left Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And uh, I'm not giving you the accurate translation yet, but Hamd belongs to the Master of the Worlds, or the Lord of the Worlds. That's how it's translated, right? And you don't even say the word Allah. But remember what I said, praise the Lord. Can that be confusing to somebody? When you say to somebody, hey, Hamd belongs to Rabbil Alameen, is it possible they have a different concept of Rabbil Alameen? Now if I talk to my, my friend in Louisiana and I say, Praise Allah, the Lord of the worlds, then there's no confusion left for him. <laughs> that I'm referring to Allah. This actually happened in the Qur'an. Which messenger was supposed to face off against magicians? Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam faces off against the magicians. They throw their ropes and their rods. He throws the staff. It swallows everything they came up with. What happens to the magicians? What did they do? They fell into sajda. Fir'aun is standing on stage. They're, on, they're in sajda over there. He's like, he's confused. Like, what's going on? Are you getting ready for round two? Or is this part of the act? Or, or what is that? So they get up from sajda and they say, Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen. We believe in Rabbil Alameen. Fir'aun is still confused. Because he says, I know, I know, me, I know. Because he thinks he is what? Rab. So when they say, Amanna bi Rabbil Alameen, he has no problem with that. He's like, and? Go on. And they say, no genius, Rabbi Musa wa Harun. The Lord of Musa and Harun, not you. They had to clarify. They had to clarify. Because if they just said Rabbil Alameen, he would have had no problem with that. You understand? So the word Allah is critical. The word Allah in Alhamdulillah is critical. But there's another thing too. Oh, so beautiful. When I thank a painter, like I look at a painting, or they made me a calligraphy piece or something, and I say, thank you. What have I just thanked them for? Their art. When you thank a teacher, you thank them for the way they taught you. When you thank, you know, uh, uh, somebody who helped you, you thank them for the help they did for you. Thanks is specific to what was done for you, yes? Praise is also specific. You praise the beauty of a mountain because of its beauty. You praise the freshness of the air because of how you enjoy it. But then when we say, if, if we say, Alhamdulil Khaliq, praise and thanks belongs to the Creator. Then the only thing we're thanking Allah for is creating. If we say Alhamdulil Hakim, praise and thanks belongs to the wise. The only thing we appreciated about Allah is what? His wisdom. How do I appreciate everything about Allah? And I don't miss anything. The things I can think of and the things I can't even think of, I include everything in one concise statement so that I truly get to thank Allah the way He deserves to be thanked in one statement. The only option I have left is what? Alhamdulillah. It's the only option. So that's a little bit of a taste of Alhamdulillah. Now this exercise I did with you guys, this exhaustive exercise of just kind of exploring what Alhamdulillah is and what are the alternatives and how come the alternatives are not good enough. Can you imagine this exercise exists for the entire Qur'an? Word by word by word by word. And it gives you an appreciation of the Qur'an like nothing else. I was recently asked why the Fatiha? I say if Muslims begin to reflect deeply on the Fatiha, it would open the doors to the rest of the Qur'an. When we underestimate the Fatiha, naturally we are going to underestimate the rest of the Qur'an. When we begin to appreciate the depth and the beauty of the Fatiha, it will make us want to explore the rest of the Qur'an. So Fatiha literally, what does it mean? The opener. When you reflect on it, it opens the rest of the doors.
It open, and you don't reflect on it, the doors remain closed. That's what we're trying to do today. That's why the Fatiha. What's the next phrase in the surah? Alhamdulillahi what? Rabbil Alameen. Rabb. How many names did we say Allah has? At least 99. Allah chose one of them. His first description to us. Of all the descriptions He could have chosen. Khaliqi samawati wal ard. He could have chosen that. Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. He could have chosen any of them. He chose one. Now that he's given you his name, which is Allah, here's the first thing you should know about him, which is what? Rabbil Alameen. That's the first thing you need to know about him. So we have to spend a little bit of time on this. The word Rabb is complicated. It has a lot of meanings. At the very base of it, they say in Arabic, Al-Rabb huwa al-Malik, wal-Mun'im, wal-Murabbi, wal-Sayyid, wal-Qayyim. I'll make it in English for you, it's, it's gonna be easy. Rabb is someone who owns. Number one, the owner. It's the first meaning of Rabb, the owner. But if he's the owner, what does that make me? What does that make me? Property. Right? An owner has what? Property. It makes me property of Allah. That's the first meaning, al-Malik. The second is a murabbi. Murabbi means someone who ensures the growth. Someone who takes care of something so it can grow. That's called a murabbi. Now the thing of the word murabbi is, is it possible that you own something but you don't take care of it? Does that ever happen? Like you own a car but you don't do the oil change? Right? You own a computer but you never clean out the files or whatever? You download all kinds of you know, dumb things and it gets a virus and all of that. You own but you don't? Take care of it. It's very possible. Like, you know, you have a backyard, but you never garden in it. And it's all kinds of crazy things growing in the back. Or your kids have a room and they don't take care of it. Right? So you have ownership, but you don't care. The word Rabb is someone who owns, but also what? Cares. He takes care of it. He makes sure that it's take well, uh, you know, cared for. That's Murabbi. Wal Mun'im. The third is... You own something, you take care of it, and you give it gifts. You give it gifts. Now, just because, for example, and obviously we don't have slavery like that anymore, but if you, if you have an employee, it's one thing to have an employee, it's another thing to take care of your employee, and it's another thing on top of that to give your employee what? Gifts, benefits, on top of what he deserves. On top of what she deserves, you're giving gifts. And if, you won't, if you're reluctant to do that with an employee, you would even be more reluctant to do that with a slave. Imagine someone back in the day, I mean, we don't have the concept of slavery like that anymore, but we have the concept, for example, of owning animals. Somebody owns a goat. You're not gonna buy your goat a nice bow tie or like, you know, you don't give it gifts. You just take care of it and that's enough. But the Rabb is someone who owns, who ensures the growth, who also gives gifts. What that means to you and me, I'll talk about in a second. Wal qayyim, and the one who makes sure it stays together, it doesn't fall apart. Because if he stops taking care of it, it falls apart. How many of you are into gardening? At all? Nobody? Okay, that's okay. It's okay. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to hold it against you. Sometimes in gardening, you have very delicate plants. And if you don't take care of them for one day, they will fall apart. Some of you take care of like fish. You don't feed it for one day. Oh. It's okay, it's okay. He's poor kid. Can somebody find a parent please? He's like poor kid. Like so many people here. Okay. If your child has a blue t-shirt and they're hyperactive, that's where they are. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I was saying as sayyid al-Malik wal-Murabbi wal-Mun'im wal-Qayyim, the one who maintains the existence. If Allah stops taking care of us for one second, for half a second, everything falls apart. The blood circulating in my hands, the heart beating from one beat to another, is because Allah is letting it. Allah is making it even. He stops taking care of it for one second, and it's gone. It's all gone. This is Qayyim. So we're, what that word means is we're completely dependent on Allah, constantly. Then finally, the final meaning of uh, Rabb is a sayyid which means someone who has full authority. Someone who has full authority. 
Is it possible that you own something but you don't have full authority over it? You own a car but you cannot drive it however you want. Is that possible? You own a property but you cannot build however you want. You have to follow regulations. Is that possible? Yeah. But when someone owns something and they have full authority to do whatever they want, then they are called Rabb. Then they are called Rabb. Allah introduced Himself with the word Rabb. Rabb means someone who owns you, which means you own nothing. Rabb is someone who will make sure that you grow, He will care for you, so He doesn't just own you and not care. Rabb is someone who will give you gifts, which means I, I, first of all, I don't own anything, so anything I do own must be a gift. It's not something I earned. I didn't pay for my hand. How much are you willing to sell your hand for? A leg for? A nose for? An eye for? What are you willing to pay for? <laughs> SubhanAllah. Priceless gifts, huh? These are gifts given to us. Who's willing to sell their heart? Who's willing to, who was willing to do that? SubhanAllah. This is, these are priceless gifts. Then on top of that, wal mun'im, wal qayyim, and he's maintaining my existence. I only exist because he's letting me. One breath to the next is not because I eat well, I do exercise, I take care of myself, I, you know, I make sure I breathe in a healthy environment, etc, etc. That is not why I'm alive. I'm alive because He's letting me stay alive. There are plenty of ways people can stop existing. I, have, I, I knew of people that were younger than me. Younger than me, just... And perfectly healthy, exercise, everything. And out of nowhere, the guy's cooking breakfast for his children, falls and dies of a heart attack in the kitchen. 29 years old. With no history of heart attacks, with no, no, no priors in the family, nothing. That depends on Allah. We're, we're not independent of that. From moment to moment to moment. And finally, a recognition that I actually have no authority. Entirely the authority is in Allah's hands. All of that comes from the word Rabb. It, it all comes from the word Rabb. Now about this word Rabb. You know, when I say teacher, who does a teacher have a relationship with? Students. When I say parent, who does he have a relationship with? Children. When I say boss, employer, who does an employer have a relationship with? Employees. There are some titles that necessarily have a relationship. When you say intelligent, it doesn't necessarily have a relationship with anyone. When you say tall, that doesn't mean you have a relationship with anyone. But when you say employer, it means you have a relationship with who? Employee. Now there are some names of Allah that don't give you a relationship. Allah is knowledgeable. The word knowledgeable does not give you a relationship. It's a description of Allah, independent of anybody else. But when Allah calls Himself Master, Rabb, with all of these meanings, is it necessarily creating a relationship? Yes? Allah introduced Himself with the first description the first description of Allah is something that builds a relationship. Now we have lots of relationships with Allah. Allah is the creator, we are the creation. Yes? Allah is the giver, we are the recipients. Yes? Allah is the teacher, we are the students. Yes? These are all relationships we have with Allah. But Allah says put all of those relationships as second. The first relationship you need to know about that is the one that you will never let go of. That is the one that will always be there every moment of your day. Is which one? That He is Rabb and you are and I am what? What does that make us in Arabic? You know the term? Abd. Slave. It makes us a slave. Now I've explained the word Rabb. We need to understand the word Abd. Because that's, that's what completes the relationship, doesn't it? I won't tell you a lot about the word Abd. I'll just tell you one thing. Because Allah introduced His part of the relationship, which is that He is Rabb. The only thing left now is what about our end? So when you go further down in the Fatiha, what are you going to find? Iyaka na'budu. We are Abd. We become your Abd. We're ready. We accept you as Rabb. By the way, my teacher used to say, Dr. Abdul Samir used to say, he used to ask me one time, we were just sitting, like studying Arabic with him. He's like, hey, give me a summary of the entire Quran. I was like, uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean. He goes, give me one sentence that is a summary of the entire Quran. And I was like, 
Okay, 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 I got this. Accept Allah as Rabb and accept yourself as Abd. That's it. He goes, yep, you got it. I've taught you something. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's all it is. Accept Allah as Rabb, accept yourself as Abd. Now what is a slave? A slave is someone who doesn't have a choice. The bottom line, a slave is someone who does not make his own decisions or her own decisions. The decision is made for them. Let me be silly with you. We don't have slavery, but let's just pretend. Imagine one of you comes over and you say, Hey, Noman, you're my slave. And I say, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so now you're the master and I'm the slave. And we're just sitting, I'm just sitting there like awkward silence for 10 minutes. So you, you want to go get some coffee or something? What do you... A slave does not have free will. So the only thing he can do is what the master wants. But he cannot do what the master wants until the master tells him. If, if the guy just said, you know, I'm my slave. I was like, okay, fine. And he doesn't tell me anything. If he doesn't tell me anything, the only thing left for me to do is whatever I want. Until he tells me to do something. You understand? What's the difference between a slave and an employee? An employee is only working for a set number of hours. Then they're free. But a slave is a slave when? 20, when you're sleeping, you're a slave. When you're awake, you're a slave. When you, on the weekends, you're a slave. On the weekdays, you're a slave. In the morning, you're a slave. At the night, you're a slave. At the masjid, you're a slave. Outside the masjid, you're a slave. You're not, it's not a time when you're not a slave, you understand? And the second is, you can only be a slave when you know what the master what? Wants. If you don't know what he wants, well, then you are going to do what you want. And if you do what you want, by definition, you are free. Yes? So, what I'm trying to get at then is, there is no such thing as slavery until the master gives instructions. Is that clear to everyone? There's no such thing as slavery until what happens? The master gives instructions. Now Allah called himself master, which makes me slave. And makes me think, well, well if he's master, what do I need? I need instructions. Is the Fatiha, anywhere in the Fatiha, did I recognize that I'm a slave and then I asked for instructions? Did that happen? What do we say in the Fatiha? That's asking for instructions. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us. Okay, tell me what to do now. I've accepted slavery of yours, now you need to tell me what to do. What path I sh should I walk? Guide me to the straight path. There's a logical connection between master and guidance, you understand? That's why all over the Qur'an, it's so beautiful. You will notice in dozens of places, Allah mentions Rabb and guidance. Rabb and guidance. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى If you know the surah, say it with me. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى the first ayah was Rabb, then you find Hada. Asa an yahdiyani Rabbi li akraba min hadha rashada. Kalla inna ma'ya Rabbi sayahdini. Rabb and guidance, Rabb and guidance, Rabb and guidance, because they're connected with each other. So the first part Allah describes Himself, in the later, later part when we get to it, the really juicy part, we're gonna see that Allah Azza wa Jal. He's only our Rabb when we accept His guidance. Otherwise, we, you can accept Him as a creator. You can accept Him as a maker. But you still haven't accepted Him as a master until you accept His guidance. That's the, that's the logical connection here in the Fatiha. A lot of people overlook that, you know. A lot of people don't see that. A lot of people think, oh, Allah made me, Allah created me. Fine, but that's not the first thing He asked of you to recognize. He asked you to recognize that He is your master. That he's your master. So that's about Rabb. Then about the word Al-Alameen. Something just very brief about the word Al-Alameen. How is that translated, Rabb Al-Alameen? Anybody know? Call it out. Lord of the worlds. The problem with the word worlds is not a good translation of the word Al-Alameen. If you want to say worlds, the Arabic word for that is Al-Awalim. Al-Awalim. But the word here is Al-Alameen. I'm not going to get technical with you guys Because if I get technical with you guys There will be accidents in the parking lot So I'm just going to keep it simple Alameen means worlds of people Worlds of people What Allah is saying is different generations And different nations That's Alameen 
That's why Allah says, Anni faddaltukum to Bani Israel, Anni faddaltukum ala al alamin. I gave you preference over all the other nations. Every nation is called a world. It's really beautiful. Every generation is also called a different world. If you ever talk to a senior who's like 70, 80 years old, tell me what life was like when you were young. And he'll start by saying, oh, it was a different world. Have you heard that? It was another world back then. We landed here, we came to Malaysia, we came to Singapore, we look around, we're like, this is another world. A world we didn't know. A world we're not familiar with. We don't just think of it as another country, we think of it as another world. As a matter of fact, in the United States, I lived in New York most of the time, and in New York, you don't say hi to people. By the way, if you ever go to New York, don't say hi to people. Okay, it's not a good idea. You know, you say, so if somebody comes, comes up to you and says, hey, how's it going? You better take out the pepper spray or like run. You don't say hello. But I went to visit my sister in Atlanta, Georgia. And everywhere you go, hey, how's it going? Nice morning. <laughs> like, you know? And that's just how they are. It's a different world. You know, I would go off to California and the streets are actually clean. I'm not used to that. I'm from New York. You know, and there, are, there are palm trees, and there are people that are smiling. It's all wrong. Everything's wrong about that place. You know? So I said, this is, I called the wife, and I said, this is another world. I don't understand this. So the idea of worlds is there are distinct cultures. There are distinct civilizations. And Allah says, I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter which civilization. It doesn't matter which culture. I am the master of all of them. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. In this ayah also, Allah says that it is Allah who created different cultures. It is Allah who created different civilizations. It is Allah who created different languages. And He's the master of all of them. So you don't have to be like anybody else. You could be like yourself, it's fine. Islam doesn't want us to look like Arabs or to be Arab. It doesn't want that. It respects every culture because Allah says He's not just a Rabb of one alam, He's the Rabb of al alameen Allah gave us guidance. So long as you can live by your guidance, you can be happy in whatever culture you're in, whatever society you're in, whatever language you have. They're all honored by Allah. It's beautiful. Rabbil Alameen. The other thing Rabbil Alameen does, all of us are slaves, which means all of us are equal status, which means no nation is better than another nation. If the people knew that, man, we would have a different kind of international politics. If, if the world knew Rabbil Alameen, that all nations deserve respect, all people deserve respect. Because all of the only one that put all of them in place is the Rabb who takes care of all of them and gives all of them gifts and guides all of them and is the authority over all of them. So why do they have to fight for over authority over each other? That's all, it's so beautiful. Just Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, just that. Now that he's described himself as Rabbil Alameen, the next part comes along. What is that? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Oh my God You better be ready for this After this one I'm going to give you a two minute break Because you need to like process this You need to pro you need also need to stretch and maybe punch somebody I don't know But I'm, I'm going to do this one for 10-15 minutes And I'm going to give you a short short break Not to run away Just stand in your place and cry and make international phone calls Whatever it is you do And then we'll continue again But listen to Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim How is it translated? People call it out please Call it out. How is it translated? The merciful, the merciful? The most gracious, the most merciful? The most beneficent, the most merciful? The most merciful, the most kind? The merciful, the beneficent? The beneficent, the beneficent? <laughs> These words are so difficult to process in English. In English. The most beneficent. When do you use beneficent in conversation? Have you ever used it actually in a real conversation with someone? Like somebody helped you with your homework, you are so beneficent. <laughs> like, you, know, you, don't, you don't do that. If you normally use the word beneficent, see me after the program. I have a few psychologists I can refer you to. <laughs> the point is, in, in translate, the purpose of translation is that we get to understand the text. But if we start using words in translation that we ourselves don't use and can't relate to, then it defeats the purpose. You, you, sh you don't have to have overly artificial translation. You have to have translation that's close to the text, but also close to you. You know, that's, that's how translation makes sense. So anyway, let's talk about Rahma, uh, ar rahman Ar-Rahim a little bit. Both of these words have to do with the word Rahm. 
The, they have to do with the word Raham. Which is what my talk was about back in Malaysia, but I'll just repeat one or two things from it. The word Raham actually means, has the meanings of intense love, care, concern, and mercy. Mercy is the last part of it, not the first part. Love is first, care is first, concern, and then mercy. This is Ar-Rahman, this is Rahma. When we call Allah Ar-Rahman, we already acknowledge that Allah has love for us. Allah cares for us, He's concerned about us, and He will show us mercy. Though that's the acknowledgement inside any word that has to come with Ra, Ha, and Meem. Allah is Rahim, Allah is Rahman, Allah is Rahim. But what is the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? In this difference, there is a world of beauty. Oh my God, I mean, you will appreciate Allah like nothing else except in these two names of Allah. Allah just called Himself Master, didn't He? Rabb. Master, and I gave you the separate meanings, but at the, at the top of it all is master. Now when you have a master, he has authority. And when you think of authority, you don't think of love. You don't. And Allah is telling us right away, I am a different kind of master. You will never find a master who will be described with Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. You will never have, an, you pick any other master, they'll never give you love. They'll, they'll tell you what to do, they'll punish you, They'll make you, they'll force you to do things. They might even take care of you once in a while, but they will never give you love. They'll give love to their own. You know? This is what every other master does, but this master starts with love. Now, there are two names. Both of them have to do with love and mercy. Ar-Rahman and what? Ar-Rahim. But what's the difference between them? Again, not going to get technical, but I expect you to remember this. I'm going to quiz you on this. And if you give me bad answers, I'm not coming back. Ar-Rahman actually does three things. I want you to remember three themes inside the word Ar-Rahman because of the way it's spelled. Number one, it is extreme. It is extreme. It is beyond expectation. That's the first. Extreme and beyond expectation. What that means is Allah is not just loving, He is what? Extremely loving beyond expectation. So whatever you expect from Allah, from love and mercy, know that it is beyond your expectation. That's the first meaning. The second meaning of Ar-Rahman is that it is something happening immediately. It's something, you don't have to wait for it, it is happening immediately. In English, think about this in English. What's the difference between someone who is patient and someone who is being patient. I'll say it again. The difference between someone who is patient and someone who is being patient. Which one is showing patience right now? Being patient. Like for example, I say about my wife, she's patient. She's patient. I don't know for sure if she's going crazy right now or not. I don't know. But if I say she is being patient, I'm talking about her when? Right now, you understand? Ar-Rahman is something happening not generally but right now. In other words, in Ar-Rahman, we acknowledge that Allah is... Not, you don't have to wait for Allah to show you love or to show you care or to show you mercy. It is actually happening in its extreme form when? Right now. But the third part. So the first one was extreme, the second one is right now. Here's the third part of the meaning. Oh my goodness, this third part of the meaning is kind of hard to... It's hard to take in when you first hear it. it. Sounds wrong, but it's actually correct. It's temporary. Temporary. Every word on this pattern in the Arabic language is temporary. Ghadban means extremely angry, but your anger eventually calms down. Some sisters like, no, not my husband's. It's always the same. But, <laughs> but no, Ghadban means you're extremely angry and eventually you calm down. Atshan means you're extremely thirsty, but eventually you drink water and you're okay. Jawaan means you're extremely hungry, but you eat and you're fine. You understand? So when you add the an at the end like that in Arabic, the quality is extreme, it's right now, but it's not what? It's not permanent. But it's, it's not enough to say that it's temporary. There's one more thing. It's temporary because something takes it away. What takes thirst away? Drink. What takes hunger away? Food. What takes anger away? A slap. <laughs> like something takes it away. You understand? But then you know what we're saying? We're saying Allah's love is extreme. It is beyond expectation. Allah's love and mercy is coming right now. But don't mess up. Because if you do something 
so bad you might actually be disqualified from it because it might be taken away and we'll talk about how it can be taken away but we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for now that's Ar-Rahman what's the next name of Allah? Ar-Rahim you have to remember two things about Ar-Rahim but before I go to Ar-Rahim it's exam time what was the first quality of Ar-Rahman? it's extreme, very good number two right now, number three temporary now two qualities, it's less less work for you, for Ar-Rahim it's some sifa Ar-Rahim, number one quality that it's permanent number one quality of Ar-Rahim is anything that sounds like Rahim is permanent is that different from Ar-Rahman? it is, huh? the second quality of Ar-Rahim is not necessarily right now there are two qualities of Ar-Rahim one, it's permanent two, it is not necessarily right now for example when I say my teacher is merciful my teacher is merciful or if you say my mother is loving that's a long term quality isn't it? but does it mean she's loving right now? not necessarily right now you understand? okay now think about this if Allah only said Ar-Rahman then the love and mercy of Allah would have been extreme and it would have been right now but it would not have been it would not have been permanent if Allah only said Ar-Rahim the love and mercy of Allah would have been permanent but it would not have been extreme and it would not necessarily have been right now how do I talk about the love and mercy of Allah so it's extreme so it's right now and it's permanent all at the same time the only way to do that is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Subhanallah you cannot talk about Allah's love and mercy in better terms than Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim but that still doesn't answer the question why is Ar-Rahman first? why is Ar-Rahim second? please listen to this carefully you are at work you get paid on what day of the week? what day do you get your paycheck now over here? huh? first of the month? okay so it's the first of the month and your boss is not there at the office and you're supposed to leave the office at 5 o'clock and it's already 4.45 and you still haven't gotten your paycheck and you need your paycheck because you need to buy those shoes you saw so you need your paycheck and you're getting desperate, it's already 4.45 and your boss isn't there and your co-worker says, don't worry, he's reliable he's reli he'll be here relax now it's 4.48 and your, your, your co-worker says, don't worry, he'll be here. He's reliable. He's reliable. And you'll, you're like, I know he's reliable. I wish he was being reliable right now. Don't tell me he's responsible, reliable, good. I don't want to hear that because that's just his quality. It's not necessarily happening right now. When I'm in trouble, I need help when? Right now. So you want the name of Allah that gives you the help when? Right now first, and then you want the other name. The other name that takes care of the future. When Allah says Ar-Rahim, it's permanent, right? Which is a guarantee of the future. But when Allah says Ar-Rahman, it is immediate. It's taking care of your immediate need. I'll give you another example. You go home, you're really hungry. Husbands are hungry, you get hungry a lot, you know, you get stuck in traffic. Somebody cuts you off, you know, in the, in the, on the road, and you're really upset. You finally get home, of course, and the wife somehow, I don't know how, she skipped all the traffic, she got home early, she made you a great dinner and everything, so she's home early, and she made, she made you know, and she has made dinner, but she didn't take it out. But you're so, so hungry, and you got home, and your wife says, so what do you want to eat next week? <laughs> if you're that hungry, what do you say? Woman, I don't care about next week. What do we have right now? <laughs> When you're hungry, the only thing you can think about is what? Right now. By the way, when right now is taken care of, when you're finished eating, you're like burp, and you're just, ah. So what are we eating next week? <laughs> when you pay this month's bills, you start worrying about next month's bills. When you pay this semester's fees, you start worrying about next semester's fees. You understand? So we only think about the future when our immediate concerns are taken care of. Allah understands who we are. So Allah says, Ar-Rahman, here, I took care of your immediate concern. But when your immediate concern is taken care of, where does your mind go? Into the future? He says, Ar-Rahim, I'll take care of your future too. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. 
Subhanallah. And now in Ar Rahman Ar Rahim, when Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what a genius. He was asked, what does it mean? He said, Ar Rahman is for this world and Ar Rahim is for the Muslims in the next life. He just said one brief statement Ar Rahman is for this world and Ar Rahim is for the next life. And you understand the genius of this man because he saw something. He saw that this world is temporary. And which name is temporary? Ar Rahman. And he saw that one name is permanent. And which life is permanent? Next life, subhanallah. He just sees it right away. The Sahaba saw it right away. It takes me 25 minutes to explain it to you. But they just saw it. They, just, they didn't need to have this long explanation of Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. I promised you a two minute break, so I'm going to give it to you now. I'm counting. I'm going to count to 120. Don't come up and ask for pictures. Not yet. Because then it won't stop and then we won't be able to do this stuff. We got a lot to cover. We're, we only got through Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim so far. You guys doing okay though? You guys doing alright? Okay, so do your stretching and whatever you do in Singapore. Take two minutes. I'm just afraid of the loudness. It's too loud. Okay. Alrighty. How was your break? Long and stretchy. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een thumma amma ba'd What was the last thing we talked about? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Let's move further I'm going to give you a silly example from my career Where did I used to do? What, what did I used to teach? What did I tell you? Elementary school? You know in the school that I started working at, I was the youngest teacher. All the other teachers were aunties and they were a lot older than me. And they were very tough with the kids. They were like, they walked in and the children, they put the fear of God in them. Okay? Now I'm kind of a goofy person, so I, when I got my job as a teacher, I went in the first day of class and I'm telling jokes and I'm showing them like crazy tricks like I'm sticking things in one ear and pulling them out of the other ear and like I'm doing all kinds of silly things and telling them stories and all this stuff the first day of class I still remember it. when I was leaving class everybody was like no don't go and that's not because they loved me because the auntie was coming that's the more the reason but <laughs> but still but still they like really enjoyed being in my class because I was joking around with them a lot right and I was like why are these teachers so uptight why do they make it so hard for these kids to have a good time in class you know, why can't they just be friends with them? And all the other experienced teachers, they said, so what did you do in class today? So I said, we had so much fun. We laughed, we played, we, you know, did you teach anything? No, 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 we can do that a little later. I want to, you know, be friends with them first. And they all said, <laughs> you'll find out. They just kind of, that evil laugh. And I was like, yeah, no, it's never going to happen. So a couple of days go by, I go into the class, and I'm starting to teach the class. And nobody wants to sit down in their chair. Tell us a story. Do that thing with your ear. And they're fighting with each other. And one guy's like taking the other guy's pencil. And they're drawing things. And I still remember one kid was on the back wall writing his name. And he was looking straight at me. And the friend next to him said, Hey, I think he sees you. And he said to him, Yeah, but he's a nice guy. And he kept going. <laughs> then I realized something. When you only show love and mercy and love and mercy and love and mercy, then is it possible that people take advantage of that? Mm, okay. I'll give you a little bit of another example. This is a kind of a silly example, but I think it'll get the point across. Imagine that there's another master and a slave. The master says, look, you're my slave, but I don't want you to do all kinds of work. I have very little requirements. All I want you to do is here's a fence. It's not even a fence, it's just a line with chalk. Just go to, don't go on the other side of it. Just stay on the inside, don't go on the outside. Don't step on the outside. Inside this line, do whatever you want. Did you find your... 
He made it. Okay. In the, in, inside this line, do whatever you want. Just don't step outside this line. That's all I'm asking. So the slave is basically free, but inside a circle. You understand? It's a pretty wide circle. It's like a few acres. Okay, so he could stay, do whatever he wants. So one day he's going and he, the slave is kind of close to the line and he slips. And he falls on the other side. And the master is watching. He's sitting on a chair on the porch. He's watching. Where does the slave look immediately when he falls, falls on the other side? He checks if the boss was watching, if the master was watching. And the master is still sitting on the chair. No problem. The master didn't say anything. He just sat there. So the slave got up and dusted himself off and went back inside. The next day, the slave kind of like he was near the fence and he pretended to fall. And he looked again and the master still sitting in his chair. He didn't say anything. The next day, he stopped pretending. He just kind of put one foot on the line and checked. And the master said nothing. Pretty soon he's walking, one foot on the outside, one foot on the inside. A few months go by and he spends most of the time on the outside. And every once in a while he checks in with the master, hey, how you doing? And the master's like, no problem, living a happy life. Then one day the master calls him, hey, come here. Okay, he comes there, he goes, remember when we first met? I told you don't cross that line. He goes, yeah, yeah, you told me, I remember that. <laughs> he goes, yeah, well, you, you started crossing it. You did it by mistake once, but then you started doing it, pretending to make a mistake, but you were doing it on purpose. And then you started doing it more and more, and then you started spending most of your time on the other side of the line. And I've been keeping record. I mean, I didn't say anything to you, but I've been keeping record. And here's the record, you, you crossed the line 5,680 times. And I, I'm going to whip you for each of those today. <laughs> you know what that is? That is a master saying, you took advantage of my mercy. And you forgot that I have a right to judge you. I will show you mercy so long as you don't try to take advantage of me. You don't try to make a joke out of my guidance. But I'm not really talking about a master and a lion in the, in, you know, in the lawn. I'm not talking about that, am I? I'm talking about us and Allah. So if you only have a Rahman al Rahim, then people will take advantage. And so Allah says, not just a Rahman al Rahim, He puts us back in check. He says, Maliki Yawmiddin. He's the master of the day of judgment. Now, this is the easy translation master of the day of. Judgment. I'll talk to you a little bit about it because there's so much more we have to cover tonight. The word Malik, the word Malik, actually, I'll talk to the word Malik later. I'll talk, I'll talk to you about justice first. Allah says He's the master of the day of judgment. Judgment here is deen. Deen in Arabic actually means precise dealing or you know, accurate dealing. They say in Arabic, kama tadinu tudanu. The way you deal with someone, they, that's how they, they will deal with you. In other words, this is an ayah about dealing with you with justice. What we are learning in this ayah is a very powerful philosophy of Islam. You only have two ways that you will be dealt with on judgment day. There's only two possibilities. Either you will get Allah's love and mercy, or you would get Allah's justice. Allah did not say you will either get mercy or punishment. That's not what I'm saying. Allah did not say either you will get mercy and love or anger. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you will either get love and mercy on the one hand, and what's the bad option? Justice. Justice. You have to understand what that means. You know, traveling in the United States, I think about, sometimes I think about the ayat in strange ways. When you travel, you know, you go through security. And you know, in like the early 2000s, like 2002, 2003, there was really tight security in American airports. You know, and so they go, they make you take your shoes off, they make you take your jacket off, belt, you know, watch everything, and they go through everything, and they give you a pat down, all of this stuff, right? So one day, I'm traveling at the airport, and the, you know, the security officer looks clearly tired. He's just like... So I go through. The, you know, the little bar thing, I go through it. 
And he doesn't stop me. He doesn't say, sir, could you step to the side? I'm going to give you a special Muslim treatment. <laughs> like, he doesn't do that. I was confused. He didn't stop me and check me extra. So I just did this. <laughs> but you know what I thought of? Hisaban yasira. Allah Azza wa Jalla on the day of judgment, you know, people will have a book in their right hand, some people will have a book on their left hand, and the book has what in it? What does the book have in it? All of our deeds. Now, you know, when you hand, have you ever graded a, have you ever taken a, your test paper to the teacher? Right? And sometimes the teacher just puts it in his bag, but sometimes the teacher says, stay right there, I'll grade it right now. You ever have that? You're standing at the desk, and your teacher is checking your exam. It is the most stressful thing you will ever do in your life. Because as soon as the red pen gets close to the paper, you just start going like, oh. <laughs> Right? Allah Azza wa Jal, even if He gives you the book in the right hand, just because you have the book in the right hand, doesn't mean it's been graded yet. You have to open the pages and check the assignment. And you know, you're, if you're like me, I'm thinking maybe I should bookmark it. If you check page 35, there's a Laylatul Qadr in there. If you just get that first, and if you, you know, I, the Hajj I think is page 80. If you look at page 80, if you could skip these pages, they're kind of, <laughs> page 80 is good. You know, students do that. Like they, they kind of make you want to skip the bad assignment and they want to show you the good work. You know? But Allah Azza wa Jal, so people are nervous and they're about to show their books to the angels. And the angels, yatajawazuna anhum, the, the hadith tells us they're just gonna say, it's okay, just go. It's okay, it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to show me page 80. It's, it's okay, you can go, sir. It's fine. It's like you're going to the security officer to show him your passport. He goes, it's, 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 it's good. you're like, really? I can just go. That means you passed. That means you graduated. You got to the other side. When you get to the other side, the guy is so happy. The guy with the book in the right hand, he goes, "Ha, umukra'u kitabia." Hey, look at my, look at what I got. Look at my score. You know when people get a bad grade. And I, I used to do this back in the first year when I started teaching the Arabic program. I used to have the exams and I used to call people's names, and I used to have them come up to the front of the class and I used to hand in their exams and then they walk back the walk of shame back to their seat. Now when students do really badly on an exam, what do they do with the paper as soon as they get it? They fold it up. And the people who got a hundred on the test, their paper falls out of their hand accidentally. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> the guy who got through security on judgment day says, hey, check out my book. I knew I was going to get a great score. I knew I was going to meet my reward. Subhanallah. Now the guy on the left hand, the guy's got a book in his left hand and the Quran describes wara'a dhahrihi, behind his back. So you got a bad report card and you don't even know how bad it is. Because it's behind your back. And the guy behind you sees it goes, oh man. And you're like, what? what? <laughs> I can't see it. Now they show their book. They show their book. And are the angels going to say, no, 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 it's okay, just go. No, they're going to open that book. They're going to go line by line. And the Prophet described, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّهُ مَنْ سُئِلَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَقَدْ هَلَكَ Someone who got asked even once on judgment day is done. If you get asked even once, in other words, if the angel stops you and says, Sir, excuse me, let me see that book for a second. What is that? What is that on Thursday? What, 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 where, where were you? What is that place? What is, what is this club here? What is that substance you're drinking? What is the amount you drank? Hmm, who are these friends you're with? Are these halal friends? No, it doesn't look like they're halal on the record. Oh man, it's all on record. With video footage, you know? They'll see what they did standing in front of them. If that record comes out, you're done. But will that record be unfair? No. On judgment day, there are people who Allah shows love to and mercy to and says, I'm not even going to open your book. Just go. It's okay. Just go. And there are people who Allah op says open their book and they get Allah's judgment. 
It's two things. Either mercy or judgment. We want Allah's mercy. We want His love on, on judgment day. That's what we want. But if we take advantage of it, Wallahi, people take advantage of it. There are people who get into haram ways of earning money. Clearly wrongdoing. They, get, they, they go into bad company. They eat the haram thing. They drink the haram thing. They smoke the haram thing. You know, they watch the haram thing. They do the haram thing. And then they say, but Allah is loving. Allah is so merciful. It's so awesome. It's okay. Allah is not going to make a big deal out of it. You're trying to take advantage of Allah's mercy. He doesn't take lightly to that. He does not take lightly to that. Allah balanced both things. On the one hand, His love is beyond imagination. It is always going to be there for you. His mercy will always be there for you. And on the other hand, don't you think for one second that you will get to just use Allah's love and mercy to take advantage of Him and do whatever you want. Don't you start thinking like that because that will disqualify you for Allah's mercy, from Allah's mercy. SubhanAllah. It's a balance between both of those things. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim on the one hand, Maliki Yawm din on the other hand. Now I'm not going to go into more detail tonight with these three ayat, but I will tell you this. This is, this is now we're getting to the, my favorite part of this, this session. These three ayat, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and what? Maliki Yawm din are the most complete introduction to Allah in the Qur'an. What every human being needs to know about God is in these three ayat. That's all you need. That's all you need. Somebody says, what is your God in Islam like? What do you believe about Him? You just need three ayat of Fatiha. The first thing He told us about Him is He deserves praise and thanks. The second thing He told us about Him is that He's our master. The third thing he told us about himself is like he's not like any other master. He has extreme love for you, extreme mercy for you. And the last thing he told us about himself is just don't think his extreme love and mercy can be taken advantage of. He will deal with some people justly if they do wrong to him. If they, if they, if they continuously do wrong to him. SubhanAllah. It's enough. It's complete. But at the end of it all, what is the relationship we have with Allah? I told you this already. What's the, what's the primary relationship we have with Allah? That He is Master. We are slave. That's the relationship. If someone truly understands this introduction to Allah, then necessarily they reach a conclusion. That conclusion is iyaka na'budu. That is the conclusion. Iyaka na'budu. It is only and only you that we give ourselves to willingly into slavery. Now let's talk about slavery. Has slavery ever been willing or unwilling? What's the usual form of slavery? Willing or unwilling? Unwilling. Nobody says, hey, I'm looking at different career options. And I kind of enjoy long chains on my feet and you know. Nobody applies for the slave job. You understand? Slavery is never done willingly. In my crazy example, yes, you came up to me and said, hey, you're my slave. I was like, okay, let's do this. That was willing. But that doesn't normally happen, does it? Allah is, there is no more powerful master than Allah. And you know, here's the other thing about all other masters. Usually slaves love their master or hate their master. They hate their master. The first chance they get, they will want to get Freedom. And even if they praise their master, is it real or ge genuine or fake? It's fake. But the surah began with Alhamdulillah. It's real, genuine praise for this master. How can that be? It is because this master did not force you to be a slave. You have to come to that conclusion yourself. That's why he didn't even say, U'budullah. Be slaves to Allah. He, we said, Iyaka na'budu. We give ourselves to you in slavery. We are ready. We made the choice. We will ourselves. We will ourselves into slavery. It's incredible that the religion of Islam tells you in the Fatiha itself, you have to make a choice. Nobody can make you be Muslim. You have to come to Allah yourself. And why should you come to Allah? You should come to Allah because of the first three ayat of the Fatiha. That's enough for you. 
If you really knew what Alhamdulillah meant, if you really knew what Rabbil Alameen meant, if you really knew what Ar Rahman Ar Rahim meant, and if you really knew what Maliki Yawmiddin meant, each of those are pre plenty of reasons by themselves, but all together more than enough to say, Ya Allah, I'm your slave. I don't want to do what I want to do anymore. I want to do what you want me to do. Because what you want me to do is better for me than what I want to do for myself. Because you are my caretaker. My, you love me more than I can imagine. And your love is coming all the time. And your love came, Allah mentioned His love even before He mentioned slavery, didn't He? So He gives His love even to those who don't become His slaves. Even those who say bad things about Him. Even those who disobey Him. Ya Allah, you've been so good to me, I am ready. Just, just take me. I'm ready, I sign up. This is what you and I say when we stand like this. Some of you are watching a movie, pretty bad one too. And then you pause, then you make salat. Ya Allah, I'm only your slave. I never disobey you. I came to this conclusion myself. Please guide me. Then you say salam and hit play again. That makes sense? You know? Some of you come for Jumu'ah. You come for, and thousands of you saying to Allah, Ya Allah, I'm your slave. I came to that conclusion myself. I realize I don't want to, what I, when I do what I want to do for myself, I hurt myself. I want you to guide me. And then right after Jumu'ah, you do some pretty messed up things. You know? What is that? That means we're saying something with our tongues, but it hasn't reached here. And we haven't actually thought about it. We haven't actually become conscious of what we are saying. Whenever we say, Iyaka na'budu, we are making an agreement with Allah. We're telling Allah something about ourselves. We're making a claim to Allah. How do you, how do you tell your mother that you love her? You come to her house. She tells you, take your shoes off, you don't take them off. She tells you, eat on the dinner table, you eat in the couch. She says, don't bring your friends over, you bring your friends over. She says, don't make loud noise, you turn the volume up. And then you tell her, I love you, mom. Is that, is that a joke? Is she hurt when, she said, when you say, I love you? Is that actually offensive to your mother? Are we being offensive to Allah? We do everything He tells us not to do, we do. And then we say, Ya Allah, I'm your slave, totally your slave, absolutely, Ya Kan Abudu. I'm your slave. SubhanAllah. Wa Iyaka Nasta'een. And it's only your help that we seek. One of the most beautiful ayat in the Quran. Iyaka Nasta'een. Easy translation, it is only and only your help that we are looking for. It's only and only your help that we're seeking. But what in the world does that mean? My goodness. When we decide that we are going to be Allah's slaves, we have to realize that's not an easy thing. That's a pretty big commitment made to Allah. It's not a small thing. And when you make a big commitment, you need help. So we say to Allah, Ya Allah, I just made a pretty big commitment. I don't think I can do it on my own. <laughs> can you help me with that? Please help. I can't do it on my own. That's the first meaning of Iyaka Nasta'een. But one of the most beautiful lessons in Iyaka Nasta'een, in the Arabic language, there are like a dozen words for help. Nasr and Musa'ada and Madad and Aoun. And, there are tons of them. Allah used Aoun. Nasta'een comes from the Arabic word Aoun. It's a very specific kind of help. I want you to understand this help because it will open doors of understanding in your life. It really will. When you say Iyaka Nasta'een, what are you actually saying? You're driving on the road and you have a flat tire. You pull over to the side. Now what do you do? You get out of the car and you look for a spare tire in the back. You take it out and you're jacking up the car. You're trying to lift the car so you can put the spare tire on. But you are not strong enough to lift the car the whole way. So when somebody is passing by, you say, hey, can you help me? And they help you. That is called isti'ana. In other words, isti'ana is when you are already trying, you could not finish, then you ask for somebody's help, that's called isti'ana. Isti'ana is not that when you had a flat tire, you sat in the car, and somebody passed by and said, hey, I have a flat tire, can you help me? He says, yeah, okay, well, 
Here, here's the button to pop the trunk. Can you press that for me? And then take it out. I'm going I'm to sit here. I'm listening to the news right now. I just, that's not nasta'een. That's not isti'ana. Why not? Because isti'ana requires that you are doing work first yourself. And then you couldn't finish and you need somebody else's help. You got that? So la lazy people cannot ask for isti'ana. Lazy people who don't do any work, you can't ask for that kind of help. By saying nasta'een, we are actually telling Allah, Ya Allah, I am trying. I am telling you I am trying. I am putting in the effort. You can see it. And now I need your help. So anybody in the world who turns to Allah and says, how come you don't help me? And people do that. People ask Allah, how come Allah doesn't help me? And they don't, don't even try themselves. They make no, no effort themselves, but they blame Allah for Him not helping. They have only themselves to blame. This is a principle of Allah. He will help you when you start making the effort yourself. If you never make the effort yourself, and He will not help you. There are two things you have to understand here. I'll go through both of them. There are people in the world who don't do any effort and then expect Allah to help them. It will never come. The Sahaba were helped by angels in the battle of Badr. You know about that? The companions were helped by angels in the battle of Badr. But the Sahaba had to go into battle, meet the enemy, and then the angels came. The angels were not there waiting ahead of time. We've been here since 3 o'clock. Where were you? It doesn't work that way. Ibrahim alayhi salam has to be thrown into a fire, then it turns cool. You understand? Help, you have to do the, your part first. Everything you can, and then Allah's help will come. It doesn't come on its own. Then there are, the other side of that is, there are some people who think they can do everything themselves. They don't need to ask Allah for help. I got my job because I'm very intelligent. I have a successful business because I made some very good decisions. You know, I have a good degree because I'm very smart. You know, and we start thinking we, we get this because we deserve it. Or that we earned it ourselves. The Fatiha is teaching us success even in this life comes from two things. You put the effort yourself and then you ask Allah for help. Here's the final thing about Nasta'een. When you ask someone for help, it's always specific. It's always specific. If you, if I'm hanging off a cliff, help! And somebody walks by and hands me a water bottle. <laughs> the help I was asking for was, pick me up. It's specific. I'm not just asking for any kind of help. I need this kind of help. You understand? When your pen runs out of ink, and you say, excuse me, could you, could you help me here? And you, you're asking for their pen. So if they hand you a cookie, that's not the help you were looking for. Help is always specific. Is that clear to you? Because it's always specific, you're supposed to say what you need help in. But in the ayah we say, إِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Fima. In what? We need your help, we say. We, we tell Allah, Ya Allah, we're asking for your help. But you're asking for my help in what? Are you asking for my help in your health? In your family life? Are you asking for my help in your studies? Are you asking for my help in your, in your religion? What are you asking for? You know, when someone is so desperate, so desperate that they are at a loss of words, that they can't even explain what they need help in, then they just say, help! <laughs> That's what we say in the Fatiha. Ya Allah, help. Because the, way we, the things we need help in are so many, we can't even list them. So we just say, Ya Kanastain. Subhanallah. One of the most beautiful insights by Shaykh al-Sha'rawi rahimahullah on Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'in. One of my favorite insights. He said, Subhanallah. He said, why did Allah say Iyaka na'budu first? And why did He say Iyaka nasta'in second? What happens if you reverse them? Why can't you reverse them? Iyaka nasta'inu wa Iyaka na'budu. Why not? He says there are two reasons. Why were we put on this earth? To ask for help or to do worship and slavery to Allah? So our purpose is mentioned first. And what we need to accomplish that purpose is mentioned second. But there's another even more beautiful thing. When we enslave ourselves to Allah, when we worship Allah, it is for Allah. When we ask for help, it is for who? Ourselves. 
Iyaka na'budu is for Allah and Iyaka nasta'een is for ourselves. What you want for Allah should be mentioned first. What you want for yourself should be mentioned second. It's good manners. It's good manners. Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'een. Subhanallah. You guys doing okay? Ten more minutes before the next break? You'll survive? Yeah, I'll give you another two minutes. It's okay. I want you to keep paying attention. Short attention span, you know. Ihdina. Guide us. This is beautiful. Beautiful language. The word hidayah in Arabic. Why did, why, did Allah, why did we say guide? Because Allah is the master. And you cannot have a master until He gives instructions. And how does that relationship begin with? Guidance. And then since you just said, I am your slave. I need your help. The first kind of help you and I need is you, Ya Allah, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Now if you are asking Allah to tell you what to do, that means you are ready to do it. Yes? So when we say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, we are actually telling Allah, Ya Allah, I am ready to obey you. I'm, just tell me, I'll do it. I need your advice, and when you give me advice, I'll take it. I have friends who ask me for advice all the time, but they never follow it. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? I've been telling you for four years what you should do. You don't do it. I don't want to tell you anymore. There's no point. You, are, you and I are asking Allah for advice. Don't ask Him for advice and not do it. At least try to do it. That's the first thing. The second thing that's so beautiful about the word guidance. You know in Arabic you can say Ar-Rushd also is guidance. Arshidna, guide us. Ihdina is also guide us. What's the difference though? The word Huda in Arabic comes from Hadiya. Hadiya in Arabic is a gift. When the Arab would get lost in the desert, what's the biggest gift you can give him? Guidance. Water is not good enough. Food is not good enough. Because he, he that means he'll stay alive two more hours. He'll survive one more day. But in the desert, the biggest gift you need is what? Guidance. That's why they associated survival and guidance together. The ultimate gift would be having the right directions. Especially in desert life. We are asking Allah for the ultimate gift. Ihdina. Guide us. And we didn't even say guide me. We said guide us. So it's actually, a sw we're switching. We're going from individual to collective. Everything in the beginning was actually individual in some sense. Hamd is individual. Allah is a master of me individually. Allah's mercy comes to me individually. The judgment day is about an individual. Each individual will be judged. But immediately we switch over to ihdi. Nah, because in this life, if you're going to have a healthy relationship with Allah as an individual, you have to come together as a community to ask. You have to be with other people. You need other people for guidance. You can't do it on your own. That's why it's not ihdini, it is ihdina. It has to be ihdina. And it's not even iya nahdi, which actually would have meant guide only us. <laughs> that would have been bad. Ya yeah, Allah, only guide me. Everybody else can go to hell. I don't care about that. Okay. <laughs> but actually guide all of us. We have to talk a little bit about, little bit about guidance. Before I give you your break. It's such a beautiful concept in Islam. You know, when you are lost, you need directions, right? And somebody maps it out for you, go three kilometers this way, two kilometers. See, I used kilometers, I didn't use miles. I'm proud of myself. But, you know, do, take a left and take a right and you'll get there. That is information, isn't it? Sometimes guidance is just information. But Allah's guidance is more than information. Your counselor's guidance is information. The traffic officer's guidance is information. The GPS guidance is information. That's all information. But Allah's guidance is more than information. Allah's guidance, it actually has to do with personal choices at every given moment. And we're not just asking for information, we're asking for the strength to make the right decision. Two different things. It's not just information. Sometimes we have all the information, we still make the wrong decision. Because we didn't have the, the strength, the will, the commitment, the, the, the right mindset to make the right decision. 
Don't people do the wrong thing and you tell them, don't you know that's wrong? Yeah, 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 but I got angry. That's, that's why we ask Allah for guidance. By the way, if it was just information, if guidance was just information, how many times do you need information? One time. If you're given the information, you don't have to ask for it again. How many times do we ask Allah for guidance? Over and over and over and over again, as a standard. You know, I compare guidance to understand asking Allah for guidance, you have to compare it to drinking water. You can't say, I already drank it yesterday, I'm good. It doesn't work. If you want to survive, you have to get it again and again and again. And that is why every few hours, it is as though Allah is telling us, just like your body, every few hours it needs water. Your heart, every few hours it needs what? Guidance. You have to come back to Allah and say, اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Again. Now a few hours your fuel is learning low and you have to ask Allah again. If it was just about information, it wouldn't be repeated this way. And we're also learning something else. It is not something you get to keep, just like water in your body. You, get, you don't get to keep it. Once you have it, it's not yours. You don't own it. You run out of it. Then you have to go get it again. And then you run out of it again. And you have to get it again. Nobody can say, I have it. I have it already. I don't need any more. You can't do it. That's why I like the comparison of guidance with what? Water. There's a thirst for guidance just like there's a thirst for water. Just like that. Right? So we have to keep asking Allah over and over again. Now, as sirat al-mustaqeem. What does ihdin as sirat al-mustaqeem mean? I'll give, it, give that to you inshaAllah ta'ala after our short two-minute break. Because again, I want your attention span to stay fresh. So stretch at least. At least like, you know, pull your arms up and do whatever it is you do. I'll stick around over here. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله ثم أما بعد How far did we get? Where are we? Huh? Somebody tell me إهدنا الصلاة المستقيم We talked about إهدنا We didn't talk about الصراط المستقيم there are lots of language technicalities here. I'm going to skip all of them. And I'm going to give you the bottom line of as -sirat, That's the first part about as al mustaqim that you should know just and, and try to remember this lesson as you recite the Fatiha. The, a, a minimal translation or a limited translation is guide us to the straight path. That's the one you're familiar with. But actually what the ayah is saying is guide us to the straight path guide us all the way through to the end of the straight path like the lam ihdina lis sirat al mustaqim guide us to the straight path actually would have been in arabic ihdina ila sirat al mustaqim there was a different word would have been used guide us through the straight path is also part of the meaning so here's the bottom line guide us to to through and all the way to the end of all the way to the end of. There are three implications. Let's talk about each of those. When you are looking to go somewhere and you ask for directions and somebody says, you need to take this highway. Get to this highway and you'll get there. You were guided to the highway. And by the way, people usually don't ask for directions to a road. They ask for directions to a destination. Right? So when you ask for directions, <laughs> Typically, you don't ask for directions to a path, but rather to a destination. But it's unique that the ayah is telling you and me, or we're asking Allah to ask for directions to not a destination, but to a path. A path. What we're learning here is, you won't, there's only one way to get to that destination. And once you're on this path, you don't have to be told, it's automatic, you'll get to the destination. You understand? There are some roads, they can take you into a hundred places. That can, a road can do that. But this road only takes you to one place. So if you get on this road, it's the same as getting to the destination. That's why you don't have to be told about the destination, you're just told about the road itself. It's beautiful. So the first thing is, you are told about how to get there. That's ila, that's how, get to the path. That's one meaning. The second meaning is, there are some people who once they get on the road, they say, look, I'm really nervous. Please don't hang up. I know you told me how to get to this road. Can you stay on the phone while I'm on the journey? And don't hang up. 
Stay with me? Okay, okay, I'll stay with you. Okay, what do you see right now? Oh, I'm passed by some trees. Oh yeah, I know that place. Sure, in Singapore, how do you know? <laughs> trees, yeah, 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 that's the one place, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the idea is what's called in Arabic, ma'iya. Ya Allah, guide me through this path, stay with me as I am traveling, so I am not a traveler alone. That's actually the, the interpretation of the hal form of ihdin as-sirat, the, the technical side. Ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqim. But then finally guide me all the way to the end. In other words, it's possible that I was going on the right road, but I ran out of gas. I was going on the right road, but I took an exit. I was going on the right road, but I started hitting it reverse. <laughs> ya Allah, make sure that once I'm on this path, number one, you stay with me and help me go through this road, but also get me all the way to the end. When you get to the end, you use in Arabic, you use a lam. That's why we say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana li hadha. Alhamdulillah, who guided us all the way to all the way to the end of this, meaning to Jannah. Wa ma kunna li lawla an hadana Allah. Very famous ayah of Quran. We couldn't have guided ourselves had it not been that Allah guided us. You know. So this is the the three parts of asking Allah for guidance. It's a path we have to go on. Now let's go back to Ila. Guide me to the road. That actually means you are asking Allah for knowledge. You are asking for information. Information is part of guidance. You need the information. You need to know what Allah wants. You need to know what makes Allah happy. You need to know the advice you need to have for raising a child and being a good husband and being a good, good father and being a good mother and being a good wife and you know, being a good son and daughter, being a good neighbor. You need to know how to do that. You need that guidance and that information. That's ila. When you're walking through it, just because you have the information, like Allah says, for example, about, to tell us about patience. And in one particular occasion, talks to us about patience with our children. Patience with bad children. Tough children. That's easy to read, but not easy to accept. And not easy to do. That's, Ya Allah, be with me when the time comes and I have to do that. Just because you know about it, doesn't mean you're going to do it. You know? So you're asking Allah, Ya Allah, I, you know, alone, I'm not good enough. I need you to be there with me. Then the third is, Ya Allah, just let me keep going at this until death comes. I don't want to burn out. So many people were so, so active in their deen. They were learning, they were praying, they were serious, and then they burnt out. Then they said, ah, I'm not like I used to be anymore. It, you know, it, the, the fire is gone. You don't want to be from those people. And that's captured also inside Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. Let's talk about the word Sirat now. Sirat in Arabic is translated as path. But every word in Arabic has a particular flavor. In Arabic you can say sabil for a path, like fi sabilillah. You heard that before? Right? Fi sabilillah. Sabil is a path. Tariq is a path. Faj is a path. There are lots of words for path. And of course, sirat is also a word for path. So what is sirat unique for? What is it spe specifically? Sirat is used and this word has a few qualities. I want you to note them if you're taking notes. Sirat is wide, a road that is wide, so it's not narrow. Now when a road is wide, one person can travel or multiple people can travel? Multiple people can travel at the same time, yes? So that's one benefit, sirat. Second benefit, it's straight. There's no turns, it's only straight. Sirat itself means straight. Sirat comes from the Arabic word surat, which is a straight sword. You know some swords are curved like that? And some swords are straight. When the sword is straight, then it's called surat. But it's perfectly straight. So the path is completely straight. Then the third meaning of surat is it's a path that is dangerous. Long, long implying it's dangerous. Because when you're on a long journey, you can you know, run out of supplies, run out of help, nobody for miles, things like that, right? So it's wide, dangerous, long, and straight. That is the meaning of what? Sirat. But if that's the meaning of Sirat, then what's the purpose of adding Al Mustaqim? Because Al Mustaqim in Arabic actually means straight. Wait a second. If it means straight, what was already covered? Sirat already means straight. Why add Al Mustaqim? Yeah, Al Mustaqim means straight up. Al Mustaqim actually comes from Istiqama, which is to stand up. Wazinu bil Qistas al Mustaqim, with a straight balance. 
from Qiyam, or Qiyam or Qa'im, the one who's standing, is a Qa'im. In other words, the path is not going this way or this way or this way, it is going up. Whoever travels this path is rising to Allah. Is rising. And as they are rising, they are leaving the love of this world behind. They're still living in this world. They're still enjoying this world. But some other love is taking over as they're rising. And by the way, when you're rising, are you in more danger as you're rising or less danger? In this world, when you rise higher and higher, more danger. If you're climbing up a mountain, if you're only two feet high, you're like, I'm jumping off the mountain. <laughs> That's not jumping off the mountain. You just got two feet. When you get to 200 feet, then <laughs> you're in more danger. You understand? In other words, the people who have made more progress better be more careful. So the more progress you make, the more, the more danger you're in. The more susceptible you are to fall. So you know what? That's why you find people, you'll know people in your family, you'll know friends that, are, that worship Allah a lot, that stay away from bad things, and you also notice they cry a lot and they worry a lot, and they make a lot of dua, and you're like, you're like so good, why do you? Why do you like pray so much? You're like already good. You don't realize they're up there. Which means if they fall, they're gonna fall a lot harder than you fall. So they worry more. And what this teaches us is the one who goes on this path, they become less concerned or more concerned as they go. They become more concerned. The guy who only made one foot of progress says, eh, whatever. I can handle the crash. What this also does, it teaches us, this journey teaches us that the people who go on this path, there are no guarantees. No guarantees that you are safe until you get to the very end. That's why Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim includes, that linguistically it's beautiful, it includes get me all the way to the end because if I stop halfway, whew, it's going to be really bad. Allah describes in Surah Al A'raf, He fell down deep into the earth and he went into the earth. He crashed and he made a crater. You know? And Allah says, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَرَفَعْنَاهُ بِهَا If we wanted, we could have raised him by means of the guidance, the ayat we gave him. وَلَكِنَّهُ أَخْلَدَ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ He fell into the earth. He became, a, he became a materialist. And by the way, when people crashed, you know, you ever heard of people who were religious, they were, they were serious, and then they crashed. They burnt out. When they crash, they crash bad. It's bad. I mean, they don't just stop doing good things, they get involved in really bad things. Right? So it's not, it's not a, a simple thing. And we beg Allah Azza wa Jalla, that's why اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ We turn to Allah for that. Ya Allah, keep us going on that path that elevates higher and higher and higher. SubhanAllah. By the way, there's something else about this imagery. When you go higher, what improves? When you go higher, what improves? Your view. You see things you didn't see before. You understand things you didn't understand before. You realize things you didn't realize before. Now you notice things that people who haven't gone up didn't see, but you're able to see them. And Allah says in the Qur'an, you can rise through the ayat of the Qur'an. So the more ayat you begin to understand, the better you begin to see. The higher your view gets. SubhanAllah. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. That this in, in this one phrase, the entire journey of life is captured. اِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim. Now this, you're standing at this road and it's going up and it's long and it's wide and it's dangerous. Who do you ask help for? Or are there any people that can help you? Allah will help you, yes. You already asked Allah. But it, will Allah send you some people that can help you too? The thing is, when you go to college, you go to a med school, you go to engineering school, you go to a polytechnic university, you go to a programming school, do you take advice more seriously from fellow students? Or do you take advice more seriously from graduates? Who do you think is better advice? Graduates or fellow students? Graduates. People who graduated already did this. They know what it takes to graduate. They know what it takes to get a job. Their advice is a lot better. If the guy is sitting in the class next to you, he or she doesn't know any better than you do. 
they can't be relied on they're, and maybe they're good students but you don't know if they're going to be good students tomorrow you don't know if they're going to make the best decisions because they haven't done it yet so if you want role models you have to have role models that have already gone through the path you understand? why do people ask me for Arabic studies advice? because I'm already, I've already done some of it if you're a fellow student somebody else is in the same class as you you're not going to ask them for what's the best way to study what book should I go through because they haven't done it yet you understand? I go to ulama in sciences that I haven't studied I go ask their opinion why? because they've done it I haven't done it I need their advice so in the next ayah Allah says Sirat al an'amta alayhim The path of those you showered favor upon Showered an'amta is in the past tense In other words, you will look for role models in the past You will look for, I will look for role models You will look for role models in the past Yes, we will try to help each other But my guidance tomorrow is not guaranteed And yours is not guaranteed But Ibrahim alayhi salam graduated Nuh alayhi salam graduated. Salih alayhi salam graduated. Ashabul Kahf graduated. They're done. They went through it. Yusuf alayhi salam and his father graduated. They're done. We should learn from the graduates. You understand what I'm saying? That's why the past tense is used. Allah did not say Sirat al ladina tun'imu alayhim, the path of those who you favor right now. No, because the path, the path of those who Allah favors right now is right now. It's no guarantee if they make it all the way. That's why we will always go back to the past, to those Allah highlights in the Qur'an. The other thing, the beautiful thing about that is an'amta. An'amta comes from the Arabic word nu'uma, softness, ease, comfort. Did you know cattle or cows are called an'am? Same word. Because they move softly. Allah says there were people in the past who, who went on this journey. And was this journey described as easy or hard? Was it described as easy or hard? Hard, so hard you need Allah's help And it gets more and more dangerous But Allah says Allah made this path smooth and easy for people before you You should find out how Allah made it easy for them Allah did not just say Sirat al munamin those who were blessed, those who made it all the way No, those who you favored We know we can't make it without you We know people in the past would not have made it without you You help them, show me how you help them so I can learn how you help them Then you can help me too I'll qualify for that too. So instead of praising the people who went before us, Allah actually taught us to praise Him for helping them. <laughs> Subhanallah, an'amta alayhim. Those who you favored, you know. Now you showered their, your favor upon them also means that when the prophets and the messengers and the good people that are talked about in Qur'an, this is all an answer to Salat al an'amta alayhim. I turned to Allah and said, Ya Allah, I want to be your slave. Help me. Help me, show me the path of people who've already done this And Allah says, fine Now read this Qur'an and I'll show you the path of everybody who did this path before you But Ya Allah, also show me the people who tried to go on this path and messed up And messed up, so I know how not to mess up You need to know good examples and you also need to understand Bad examples Because sometimes if you only know good examples, you start getting overconfident so you need to know, okay, well, let me just tell you also, Ya Allah, also let me know who are the people who didn't graduate? And why didn't they graduate? So what do we say in Fatiha? Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. What else do we say? Ghayr al maghdubi alayhim. Walad dalin. Both of them. Both of them. So we have to talk about both of these groups too. Well, how come Allah talked about al maghdubi alayhim? How come Allah tells us to, to say, don't, don't make us from al maghdub alayhim and don't make us from al dalin I have a lot of things to tell you about this. Very important things. I'll start with the most important. There's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is used in the tafsir of the Fatiha to say al maghdubi alayhim are the Jews and al dalin are the Christians. One of the most misunderstood hadith in Islamic studies. One of the most misunderstood hadith in all of Islamic studies. al maghdubi alayhim, the Prophet described it as the Jews. al the Prophet described it as the Christians. That does not mean that if you have a Jewish neighbor and you talk to them today, and you say, hey, I was talking to my maghdub alayhim friend, 
and he was like going to the synagogue, <laughs> you know, and my dalin neighbors, you know, it's just celebrating Christmas. That's not what that means. Let me tell you what that means. Allah's Prophet was telling us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that some among the Jews had the kind of behavior that can be described as maghdub alayhim. And there were some among the Christians who had the kind of behavior that can be described as adhalin. The criticism is about the behavior. And the Prophet ﷺ said, some Jews had the kind of behavior, you would describe it with what? al maghdub alayhim. And some Christians had the behavior, you would describe it as what? al If Allah meant to say Jews and Christians, He would have said, غَيْرِ الْيَهُودِ وَلَا nasara But it's not about the Jews and Christians. It's about behavior. It's about behavior. If you miss that point, you're, you're missing the boat entirely. But we have to understand why the Jews and why the Christians and what is Allah talking about. So I'll give you a, again a silly example. I love silly examples. It's a problem. So I have two sons, Walid and Imad. Walid is the younger one, Imad is the older one. Imagine I tell Walid, and I, I put a jar of cookies on the di dinner table. Big jar, juicy cookies, really good chocolate chip. And both of them are sitting on the couch. And I say, Walid, Imad, I'm going to the office, I'm going to make a phone call, and I'll be right back. Don't eat the cookies. You see these cookies? They look good? They look good? Yeah? Here, here. Smell it. <laughs> Don't eat it. Okay? I'll be back in five minutes. Don't eat the cookies. I say to Waleed, hey, did you understand me? Don't eat the cookies? Mm-hmm. Did you understand me? And actually, I'll make the story more interesting. Only Imad is on the couch. Waleed is upstairs. I say, Imad, don't eat the cookies. And Walid can't eat either, okay? Walid can't eat either. And Walid is little. So tell Walid he can't eat either. Okay, but I'll tell him. All right. So now, I come back after five minutes, and guess what? Cookie monster. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> now I told Imad, I told Imad, don't eat the cookies. Walid was upstairs. But they're both eating. Who am I more angry at? Imad or Walid? Why? Because I told him. You knew what not to do, you still did that? And Walid's like, I, I had no idea. Kham, kham, kham. You know? <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is, when you tell someone to do something, when you tell someone not to do something, and after knowing it, they still do it, then you get angry. After knowing it, they still do it, then they, then they get angry. It's the same tr of, of class, of teaching. I have an exam I'm giving tomorrow. To, I tell my students, Friday, there's an exam. Here are the ten questions on the exam. Here are the answers. I'm giving you everything. Get a hundred on the exam tomorrow. Because here are the questions and here are the answers. Which teacher ever does that? Then your students listening, mm -hmm, gotcha, gotcha, got it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He comes back the next day to class and he fails the test. Am I supposed to be angry at that one? Come on! I told you the questions, I told you the answers. And another student failed because he was absent yesterday. Who am I more angry at? The one who was there, the one who knew all the answers. When you do something wrong after knowing, then you deserve anger. You get that? Allah, the Prophet described the Yahud or some aspects of the Yahud as al maghdub alayhim, the recipients of rage, the recipients of anger. Why are they recipients of anger? Because the Jews in the Quran specifically, the Jews that Allah highlights, were the ones that were very knowledgeable in religion and still made the wrong decisions after knowing. When you make the wrong decision after knowing, then you are maghdub alayhim. And we ask Allah not to take that path, which means we are in danger, we are at risk of taking that path. The ayah is not about Jews, the ayah is actually about us. We sometimes know and we do it anyway. We sometimes know and we don't do it anyway. You understand? That's what al maghdubi alayhim is about. But the language of it, wallahi, the most, one of the most powerful phrases in the Qur'an describing Allah's anger. You know, 
Allah could have said, Sirat al Ladina and Anta Alehim, Sirat al Ladina or Ghayr al Ladina Ghadibta Alehim. Not those that you are angry at. He didn't say that. He said, Al Maghdub. Now the thing is, when I said the path of those who you favored, the path of those who you favored, you refers to who? First to Allah. How do we translate Ghayr al Maghdubi Alehim? Anybody know the translation of Ghayr al Maghdubi Alehim? Not of those who earned your anger. Have you heard that translation before? Not of those who earned your anger. The crazy problem with that is there's no your in the Arabic. The word your is not there. And it's not there on purpose. Allah is so angry at this people, He doesn't mention Himself. He mentioned Himself with the people that He was happy with. What did He say? An'amta alayhim. You favored. You was mentioned. But al maghdubi alayhim, Allah is not mentioned. Actually, all that's mentioned is they get anger you know, directed towards them. But Allah does not mention whose anger. It's kind of strange language. It's hard to explain in English. I'll try my best. How, you know when somebody says, this child was beat up at school. He was beat up at school. Who did I not mention? Who beat him up? I didn't mention. Is it possible more than one beat him up? Is that possible? All we know is a beating happened. We don't know who it happened from. Allah says, I don't want... We ask Allah, don't make us from those who get anger towards them, who receive anger. Allah did not mention receive whose anger. You know why? Because it's Allah's anger, and the angel's anger, and the believer's anger, and their children's anger, and their ancestors' anger. They get anger from them, at them from so many directions, it cannot be counted. So it said, they just received anger. They, these people receive anger. That's why it said, al maghdubi alayhim. Now what did I tell you about nouns and verbs today? Which one is permanent? Hmm? Nouns are permanent. Remember that? An'amta alayhim is in the past. Is that permanent? No. Which means our role models are not permanent. They're always in the past. It's done with. But the people who receive Allah's anger, Allah used a noun. al maghbub alayhim is a noun. What does that mean? That phenomenon is permanent. It was in the past, it's in the present, and you will find it in the future, which is why we are in danger of it. it was, if it was only a phenomenon of the past, we would not be at risk. But Allah made it a noun, which means it's going to happen even now, and we are not safe. But what about ad dalin ad dal in Arabic means the one who's lost. Now, some translations say, nor those who were led astray, or who were misguided. These are bad translations, because that's mudallin. Dal in Arabic, here's the bottom line, it means lost. Nor those who are lost. Now, what is, when someone is lost, what is missing? If somebody tried to come to this program and they got lost, what was missing? Directions, information, right? They didn't know. Is there a big difference between the first and the second? al maghdubi alayhim are people who do the wrong thing even after they know. al are people who do the wrong thing because they don't even know. They don't even know. That's why they do the wrong thing. So the first one's actually more... It's worse. That's why Allah talks about anger with them. The second one, Allah did not talk about anger with them. It's interesting. Allah did not mention His anger with them. He just mentioned, or He told us, don't be like these people because it's not an excuse that you're just lost. You know? And sometimes you can be lost and Allah will guide you. This word is even used for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا fahada. You could be lost and find guidance. The pro- point is, once you find guidance, you will act on it. The problem with al maghdub alayhim is they find guidance and they still don't act on it. You understand the difference between these two? Now let's talk about Muslims. What kind of Muslim could be maghdub alayhi? A Muslim could be maghdub alayhi when they know something is wrong and they still do it. What kind of Muslim could be dal? A Muslim could be dal if they do something wrong and they don't even know it's wrong. But is that an excuse? No, because we're supposed to ask Allah for guidance, which means we're supposed to ask, seek knowledge. So maybe if you didn't know yesterday, you should learn and learn today and learn and keep on learning. Now there are some Muslims who say, I don't want to learn, because if I learn, I'll be responsible. It's better I don't know. It's better I would be from the Dalin. Because I don't want to be from the Maghdub alayhim. 
That's the logic. I don't want to be from the dalli. I'd rather be from the dallin because I don't want to be from the maghdub alayhim. Fatiha is perfect because it says you shouldn't be from maghdub alayhim and you shouldn't be from a dallin. When you say I don't want to know, it's like you're saying I would. I like dallin. I want to be in that category. Eh, it's not a good idea, buddy. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. You with me? This is this is very powerful. Now I get to my favorite part of the entire night. I hold that for last. What to me personally makes the Fatiha miraculous? What makes the Fatiha so beautiful that it can't even I can't logically say even if I don't even think like a Muslim. If I think like a non-Muslim. If I reflect on what I'm sharing with you, it's hard for me to come up with how a human being can talk like this. How, how can a human being speak like this? Here's what I'm going to share with you. Pay attention to this part, okay? This is, this is probably the most important part. There are two themes in the Fatiha. Knowledge and action. There are two themes in the Fatiha. Knowledge and action. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Deen All of that is knowledge Knowledge about who? Knowledge about Allah Yes? You with me? Three ayat are about Knowledge Is that clear to everyone? When we say Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een Ihdina as-sirat al-mustaqeem Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhim Ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim wa al-dhalleen All of this is verbs All of this is about what? Not knowledge but Action. The surah began with knowledge. The surah concludes with action. You with me so far? Okay. Now there are three situations. Some people have knowledge, and that knowledge leads them to action. If your knowledge leads you to action, then you must be on the straight path. Make sense? So to be on the straight path, what do you need? You need knowledge and you need action. Okay. But there are two other situations. There are some people who have knowledge, but it doesn't translate into action. And there are other people who have action, but it's not based on correct knowledge. Now, if you have knowledge, but you don't act, which category in the Fatiha? Which category? al maghdubi they have knowledge, but they don't have the corresponding action. If you have action, well intended, but you're, it's based on incorrect information, then you have action without knowledge. Which category is that? Abdalin. The surah begins knowledge, then talks about action and knowledge together. Then it talks about knowledge without action. Then it talks about action without knowledge. It's perfectly symmetrical. It balances both of those themes perfectly. Let's go back again. The surah begins. How do you talk like that, by the way? Who, who talks like this? SubhanAllah. And the Quran just spoken. It's just spoken. It's, it, and it wasn't like it was repeated, like, let me say it another way now, because that might sound better. <laughs> There's no editorial process. Now look at it from a linguistics perspective. And I know you're not students of linguistics. Maybe probably most of you are not. So I have to make this simple for you to understand. But this is one of the most incredible things about the Fatiha. One of the most incredible things. The Fatiha, or in the Arabic language, has two kinds of sentences. They have verb-based sentences, and they have noun-based sentences. Now today I talk to you about verbs and nouns. Which one is permanent? Nouns. Which one is temporary? Verbs, yes? So the Arabs have two kinds of sentences, verb-based and noun-based. Jumla ismiya, jumla fi'liya. That's what they call it. Okay. Now when the verb-based sentences are used, the context is typically temporary. When the noun-based sentence is used, the context is typically, or the ideas are typically what? Permanent. It's just a rhetorical thing. Okay. The fa now, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. Noun-based sentences are de describe permanence. Verb-based sentences describe temporary. That's the linguistic function of them. Okay. Now, Fatiha can be divided into three parts. First, I said there are two themes. What are the two themes? Knowledge and action. Now, we're going to divide it into three parts. The first part is about Allah. You tell me which part is about Allah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen 
Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. That's part one. Part two is an agreement between us and Allah. Part about Allah, part about us. Which part is that? Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Okay, and the third part is about ourselves. We want something for ourselves. What part is that? Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, sirat al-ladhina na'amta alayhim, ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim, waladhalim. Three parts. Part one is about Allah. Part one is an agreement between us and Allah. Part three is our request to Allah. It's about us. What's incredible from a linguistics perspective is that part one is linguistically it's noun sentences. It's a noun sentence. Now, what do you know about noun sentences? It's talking about Allah, so it's only appropriate that noun sentences be used because noun sentences are permanent and Allah is permanent. What was part three about? Part three is about who? Not part two, part three. Us. That's a verb-based sentence too. And verb-based sentences linguistically are what? Temporary, just like we ourselves are temporary. What's left? What did I skip? I talked about part one, I talked about part three. What did I not talk about? Part two. Now part two is incredible because they say the noun sentence begins with a noun. And the verb sentence begins with a verb. That makes common sense, doesn't it? But sometimes they do this crazy thing where they have a verb sentence even though it began with a noun. Now when a verb sentence begins with a noun, it's considered a mixture. In Arabic grammar, you call it maf'ul bihi muqaddam. But who cares? Who cares? The middle sentence is actually a verb sentence with a noun beginning. It's a mixture of both sentences. And the middle sentence is also a mixture because part of it is for Allah and part of it is for ourselves. The linguistics of the first part of the Fatiha is noun based because it's about Allah. The middle is a mixture because it's mixing between us and Allah. And the last part is verb based because it's about ourselves. Even linguistically it's perfect. Was perfect. You couldn't move anything. Now I've talked to you about it linguistically and I've talked to you about it thematically. It's the balance of the Fatiha. But there's other balances. Let's go back. Fatiha, if you want to learn about its perfection, its perfection comes from balance. It balances things. It balanced the theme of knowledge with action. It balanced nouns with verbs. Now we're going to learn something else. It actually is a perfect symmetry because the, what's the middle of the... When something is balanced, it means it hangs from the middle. So if you put something in the middle, there should be half on this side, half on that side. So which ayah is in the middle? Which ayah is in the middle? Trick question. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Is in the middle. Okay. Now, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in itself, that ayah itself has how many parts? Two parts. What's part one? Iyaka na'budu. What's part two? Iyaka nasta'in. Now check this out. Iyaka na'budu is the conclusion of part one. Iyaka na'budu is the conclusion of part one. What do I mean? If you know Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin, what conclusion do you reach? Iyaka na'budu. That's your conclusion. I want to be Allah's slave. Now I know Allah and I want to be a slave. Now, what's the second part of that ayah? Iyaka nasta. What's the ultimate help you can get from Allah? What is the ultimate help you get from Allah? His guidance. Iyaka nasta'in is the introduction to part two. Iyaka na'budu is the conclusion of part one. Iyaka nasta'in is the introduction of part two. The surah is perfectly balanced from the middle ayah. Perfectly balanced. It's incredible. It is, it's mind-boggling. Let's go back again. The Fatiha balances other themes. Hope in Allah, hope in Allah comes from Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. But if hope is blind, you become irresponsible. So responsibility comes with what ayah? Maliki Yawmiddin. Allah balanced hope with responsibility between Ar-Rahman, between Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim and Maliki Yawmiddin. Okay, there are two other things that are balanced. If you just have praise, it's artificial. If you just have thanks, you don't include praise. How do you balance praise and thanks? What do you say? 
Alhamdulillah. It balances between knowledge and action. By the end, I told you, knowledge and action together, as sirat al mustaqim. Just knowledge, no action, al maghdub alayhim. Just action, no knowledge, al dalleen. Everything about the surah is balanced. Look at the beginning. The beginning says, Rabbil Alameen, all peoples of the world, all nations of the world. And at the end of the surah, Allah says, there are only going to be three kinds of people in all of the Alameen. The Alameen will either be the Alameen of people on As Sirat Al Mustaqeem, Al Ladina Anta Alayhim, or it will be the people of Al Maghdub Alayhim, or it will be the people of all of humanity falls under one of these three categories. Every human being on this earth is from al alamin which means every human being on this earth is either min al and an alim it's from those who Allah favored, or those who get Allah's anger, or those who are still confused and lost and don't know any better yet. Those are the only three categories. That's it. al alamin is described by the end. Fatiha began with an individual concern. Alhamdulillah. Hamd is done by a group or is it felt in the heart? Is it felt in the heart. Even if you do hamd as a group, you have to feel it in your heart individually. Will Allah judge the hamd collectively or individually? Individually. Allah is our Rabb. Individually? Is that an individual personal relationship that Allah is our Rabb? Yes. Personal. Allah's Rahmah. Allah's Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Is that personal or individual? Or personal or collective? First and foremost, it's personal. Allah will judge us on Judgment Day as individuals or as a group. Everybody will come to Allah one person at a time. One person at a time. Everything about the beginning of the Fatiha is individual. And when you get to the end of the Fatiha, it is balanced with the collective. Everything becomes collective. And the Quran itself is balanced. The Qur'an itself is bound. This is the first surah. What's the last surah? In the, in the whole Qur'an, what's the last surah at the end? Surah An-Nas. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَهِ النَّاسِ Right? Fatiha began with a positive word. It began with Alhamd, which is a positive word. Surah An-Nas begins أَعُوذُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ Which is a negative word, seeking refuge. Positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Fatiha began with a noun. Nas begins with a verb. That's the entire spectrum. Fatiha is collective. Na'budu, nasta'inu, ihdina. Nas is singular. Qul a'udhu, I seek refuge. Not we seek refuge. I seek refuge. That's about the individual. Fatiha says there are two kinds of groups you should not be a part of. Two kinds of groups you should stay away from. What are those two kinds of groups? al maghdub alayhim and al Two groups. These are, in, these are groups. If you, go to, if you go to Surah An-Nas, there are also two kinds of evil influences, but they're individual evil influences. الَّذِي يُوَسْمِسُ فِي صُدُورِ النَّاسِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ Two in the two groups over there. SubhanAllah. Everything's... And now, wait, 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 wait. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِي Finish it. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِي رَبِّ النَّاسِ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ رَبِّ النَّاسِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ he says, Malikin Nas. Malikin Nas. What do we read in Fatiha? Maliki Yomiddin. He says, Ilahin Nas. Ilah, by the way, means the one you worship. What do we say? Iyaka Na'budu. The entire thing is balanced. The entire thing is balanced. This is Fatiha, guys. <laughs> That's Fatiha. The Fatiha by itself is enough. This is the last thing I'm sharing. I'm no, no more breaks. Sorry. I just need 10 minutes for this last one. There's the last thing I'm sharing with you about the Fatiha. The ultimate balance. So all of these balances are incredible to me. But this one is, tops them all. Over and above all of them. You know, I want to talk to you about four kinds of conflicts. There are four kinds of conflicts. Wars. Four kinds of wars. Four kinds of battles and conflicts. The first battle is between my body and my soul. My heart, my heart that wants to turn to Allah and the heart that wants things from this world. There's a battle inside me. There's a battle inside you too. There's not one of us that does not have this battle. There's a spiritual thirst and there's a material thirst. 
there's a, there's a desire for the beauty of Jannah, but there's also a desire for beauty of this world. You can't fight it. It's there. And there's a conflict between those two. That's the first battle. The second battle is between men and women. Men and women. They have to live with each other, but they also hate each other. It's a love-hate relationship. It's a constant struggle. What are the rights of men? What are the rights of women? If you let women decide what the rights of women are, they will, have, they will end up oppressing men. If you let men decide what the rights of men are and women are, they will end up oppressing women. It's a constant battle. It's a constant battle. I'll give you an example. You know, you know how about divorce court? If the divorce court judge is a man who just went through a divorce and he has a case in front of him, guess what? You better not be a woman in front of him. Because you're going to get some... <laughs> You understand? Because he's biased. He's, at the end of the day, he's a man. And he can't think like a woman. And if the, if the divorce court judges a woman, and she just went through a divorce, you better not be a man in front of her because she's going to tear you apart. You understand? We can't help but be who we are. We're limited in our perspective. So there's a conflict, the social conflict between the rights of men and the responsibilities of men, and the rights of women and the responsibilities of women. That's the second conflict. The first conflict was what? What was the first conflict? Body and soul. Second conflict, men and women. Third conflict is between capital and labor. The third conflict is between the boss and the worker. The boss says you should work more and you should get paid less. The employee says I should work less and I should get paid more. They want the opposite things. The boss says you should have more time on and less time off. The employee says I should have more time off and less time on. They're on the opposite and there's a constant struggle. That's why you have labor rights. That's why you have minimum wage. That's why you have unions. You have these things in the world because there's a conflict between capital and labor. What was the first conflict? Body and soul. Second conflict? Man and woman. Third conflict? Boss, boss and? Employee. Last conflict, government and people. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. A government will want more taxes. It will want more authority. It will want more control. And the people will want more freedom. If you let the government decide everything, it will become a dictatorship. If you let the people decide everything, it will become chaos. There has to be a balance. You have to balance these things. And you know, the finding that balance is what we call the struggle for justice, yes? We, want, we call this the struggle for justice. The justice could, and this is kind of like political justice, right? Finding the balance between government and people. Finding the balance between boss and employee. Finding the balance between man and woman. Now the thing of it is, in all of these conflicts, in all of these conflicts, who will get to decide what's fair? This is the final miracle of the Fatiha, the final guidance of the Fatiha. At the end of the day, a human being will either be a man or a woman. Which means they will think like a man or they will think like a woman. At the end of the day, a, a person will either be a boss or an employee. So they can only think like a boss or they can only think like an employee. At the end of the day, either someone will be a representative of the government or a representative of the people's perspective. You can't have both perspectives. It's impossible. It's impossible. So this conflict seems never ending. This struggle seems never ending. Allah Azza wa Jal gave us the answer to these eternal... And by the way, inside us, the body and the soul. Sometimes your body will win, sometimes your soul will win. And, if you, and because we become materialistic people, we crush the needs of our soul. And some people say, no, we should be spiritual people. And they become so spiritual, they stop eating correctly, and they start dressing funny, and they start getting weird. And then they think that's spiritual, and that's not spiritual, that's just weird. That's what that is. You have, to, you have to find a balance between spirituality and living in this world. You know? How do you find that balance? Allah Azza wa Jal told us in this surah one phrase. That is the balance. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Guide us to the straight path. That doesn't lean towards men and it doesn't lean towards women. That doesn't lean too much towards the soul and doesn't lean too much towards the body. That doesn't lean too much towards capital and doesn't lean too much towards labor. Doesn't lean too much towards government doesn't lean towards towards people. Show us the path in the middle so we can live a happy life. Show us that. SubhanAllah. Because Allah created my body and He created my soul. And what He created, He cares for both of them. 
He doesn't hate one or the other. He cares for both of them. He created man and he created woman. He created the boss and he created the employee. He created the government and he created the people. So he cares about both of them. And he's the only one who can give us balance. If you if follow his principles, we'll find balance. That's the balance humanity is looking for. That's the struggle we're trying to find. Subhanallah. The, 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 uh, uh, I know time is pretty much up, but uh, okay. Last, last one, I promise, last one. I want to talk to you one more time about al maghdubi alayhim and al You know the criticism of the Qur'an of certain Jews, certain Jews, not all Jews, certain Jews, is that they were so intellectual, their hearts became hard. They were only, they looked at their religion only as something to study and to look at academically, but it was not a spiritual thing for them at all. Their hearts became hard. On the other side, the Christians are described as a very spiritual people whose hearts are soft. Their hearts are soft. But the problem with them is a lack of academics. According to the Quran, they don't look at the book the way they should. They don't ask the questions that they should. So you have the scholarly people who become too scholarly and lose their spirituality. And you have the spiritual people who have too much spirituality and lose their intellectual promise. Two problems. Will these two problems happen in the Muslim Ummah? Will you have people that learn a lot? They learn a lot and they know a lot, but they're spiritually empty, they're becoming spiritually empty. And will you have people that are spiritually very concerned but know almost nothing about the deen? Will that happen? Sure. You're gonna find the conflict between knowledge, intellectual growth and spirituality. The Fatiha, the Fatiha gives us the balance between knowledge and emotion. Remember I told you Alhamdulillah is both intellectual, both an in, in, in informative sentence and an emotional one. The Qur'an constantly throughout itself is, an, is a highly academic intellectual text and at the same time it is a highly what? Spiritual text. What other book is going to balance intellectual philosophical wisdom with Spirituality. Which book will do that? Which book can some scholar read and do a PhD on one surah and not be done? And at the same time, a farmer is listening to the same surah and crying in salat. Same surah. Which, which other book will do that? Which constitution of the world is going to make you cry? You know, subhanallah. The balance between spirituality and intellectualism found inside this one book. Subhanallah. Balance after balance after balance after balance after balance. That is the Fatiha. I pray that I was able to do some justice to the beauties embedded inside this incredible surah. And I pray that you enjoyed yourselves listening today. As I, as I leave you tonight, I know this is a very short trip this time, right? I'm actually flying out tomorrow morning, uh, uh, and I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity that was offered to us by, by Muiz and the, the volunteers and the sponsors for this program. I make dua for all of you for coming and attending. I'm really, really grateful to have this chance to meet all of you. And I know I won't get to, to say salams to everybody here, but uh, honestly, just pretend that I came over to you and that's a salam to you, because I mean it. I, I really am very grateful for all of you in attendance here tonight. I just briefly wanted to, before I let you go, introduce you to a project that I'm com committing myself to completely. Actually, more and more, I'm, I'm getting less opportunity to travel because of this one project that I think will benefit Muslims more than me actually traveling. Because I have, I have to make a conscious decision about what I think I can be of most benefit with and by team and the work that we're trying to do. There are two things we focus on in Bayina. We focus on Arabic and we focus on the Qur'an. Tonight was a little bit about the Qur'an, right? So I'll just talk to you about the Qur'an. I personally believe every Muslim should have gone through an explanation of the Qur'an. But hear me out. Hear me out. I don't expect every Muslim to read the entire translation of the Qur'an. I don't expect it. I don't even think it's practical. I don't think it's practical because either you'll get bored or confused. You will read an ayah in translation, and you're like, what does that mean? Kill them wherever you find them. What, what does that mean? You know? And you, you won't find an explanation. And maybe you don't have the wherewithal to read technical tafasir. That's even more expectation from the average Muslim. Well, they're not going to do that. That's not going to happen. Let's be practical. So my personal position on this is, the Qur'an needs to be explained in simple language, 
not in print first, but in video, in talk. You have to talk it out. That's a lot easier for people to digest. And it should be presented in a way that's not overly academic. It's just the Qur'an 101 for everybody. Especially paying attention to the parts that are confusing. Like the parts that talk about things that are used by CNN or Fox. The parts that are used, that some people use to say some very horrible things. And they misuse them to say some very terrible things. And you're like, is that, does, is, does the Qur'an really say that? Does it actually talk like that? What does that really mean? And you know what? For most people, they don't, they're not going to end up reading something about it. They're just going to stay confused for years about it. Unresolved. This was a concern I've had for some time. And to try to address that concern, one of the projects Bayina took up was the cover to cover project. The idea was to go through a translation of the entire Quran with little explanation, especially longer explanation where it is necessary. You feel like common confusions occur. What is that talking about? Or things like, how come the subject changed all of a sudden? How come the story is only a little bit here and a little bit over there? What is he talking about when he says this about women or that about inheritance? What's, what does that mean? You know, so those are common questions people have. But I wanted to make a resource available for the entire Qur'an so the average Muslim, does, there's no hurry. They just listen to 10, 15, 20 minutes of it a day, maybe every other day. And they just kind of keep going slowly through the Qur'an. And it's a lifelong kind of thing. So you go through it once, you go through it another time, whenever you have time. But it's done on your convenience. And Alhamdulillah, that project has come to a conclusion. Uh, the recordings are done for the entire Qur'an, Alhamdulillah, the cover to cover project, back in Texas. And they've already been put up online. Now this is different from YouTube, because on YouTube there's like little snippet here, little clip there, little piece here, little piece there. But it's not one organized continuum. Right? I wanted it to be like an organized library so you can just kind of, it becomes a, a, an at home or at your mobile device educational resource. That's what I really wanted it to be. Then after this project, I'll introduce you to two, only two projects even though there are more. So that was one project. The second project was, I felt that there are certain themes, there are certain subjects that the Muslims should know about because they are hurting us. For instance, the world is now flooded with indecent images. The world is flooded with indecent video and images online, on TV, in print, etc, etc. And we're, we're exposed to that, our children are exposed to that. You know, it's just inevitable. It's just there. How do we deal with it? It's a, it's a problem of our haya, of our shame, right? Of decency. Does the Qur'an have something to say about this subject? And if it does, what does it have to say? And I'm not just talking about putting a hijab on. I'm saying that shame or shamelessness is a big subject in the Qur'an. And Allah talked about it way before hijab was even revealed. Hijab was revealed 16 years after the Prophet started his mission. But Allah started talking about shamelessness from the first or second year. So it's a bigger subject than clothing. It's something, there's something more there. So I wanted to explore that meaning thematic studies in the Qur'an. I personally think, for example, a lot of parents are having a lot of trouble raising their children. Communication problems, anger management, sibling rivalry. These are problems that every family goes through. Does the Qur'an have advice about this stuff? What about parenting from the Qur'an's perspective? You know, if we believe in this book, then we believe it has solutions. We asked Allah to guide us, then He'll guide us with parenting. He'll guide us with friendship. He'll guide us in our business dealings. He'll guide us in things that matter in our life. So we should come to the book for that purpose. So I took one of these themes at a time and I started doing a series on them based on the Qur'an. Each of them. I've only, only done two so far and more are coming. So shame and parenting are done. And they're posted online too. And the re, the, I want to put this all in one place so that it becomes a, a convenient resource for you inshaAllah ta'ala. And that resource is called Bayina TV. And I'm hoping tonight, inshallah ta'ala, that you guys check it out. I mean, I can come maybe once in a year, once in two years at the most. At the most. That's a good, that's, a, that's the best case scenario. Right? But I want you to have a relationship with me and me to have a relationship with you based on Qur'an studies at your convenience throughout the year. That's what I really like to, to have. And I would like every family to have that kind of access. Because me personally, I, inshallah somebody will come along and do a better job But until that happens, you'll have to deal with me <laughs> <laughs>
So I hope you check it out tonight. It's bayina.tv. That's the URL for it. Bayina. And bayina, people don't know how to spell bayina. People spell it banyan. People spell it banoon. People spell it banyan. So I'm going to spell it out for you. It's B A Y Y I N A H. B A Y Y I N A H. Dot TV. That's where this resource is. So I hope you check it out. The clip you saw was actually me. That was the third project, actually. I teach my daughter Arabic about 15 minutes a day. And she's not a super genius. So if she can do it, you can do it. That's the point. I record it. I record it at home. I teach her. She makes mistakes. I yank her ears and all kinds of cool things to her. And she learns. Alhamdulillah. We have a lot of fun doing it. But the point is, even if you want to learn Arabic later on, then you can get started on that too on your own time. You know, this is a curriculum I use for my full-time students and I'm using it for my 10-year-old. So it works. It gets you somewhere. So inshallah ta'ala, you take advantage of that. Bayina.tv I thank you so, so very much for the honor of your presence here tonight. I, I know that I'm not going to get a chance to meet all of you. But even if I don't, my, my gracious, warm welcome and salam to you and to your family from myself and all of my team. I know because we are traveling ourselves, I would ask all of you to make dua for not just us, but our families that are missing us at the time. And you know, uh, our kids, our parents, everybody, and that Allah keep them safe. As we travel back, we're gonna be making lots and lots of dua for your community. And I pray that you're able to have flourishing lives as Muslims here in Singapore, and that your awareness and knowledge and, and practice of this deen grows, and that your communities become more and more united and a, a place where families can really find a love of Islam. That's what it's about at the end of the day. If we can give our families a love of Islam, we're doing something right as a community. So inshallah, I make dua that Allah does that for all of you. Thank you so very much for listening tonight. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.